and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. We are packed today. So much to get to. What a game last night to kick off the Stanley Cup final between the Avalanche and the Tampa Bay Lightning. Stormy Bonatoni from VEASAN will join us in just a few minutes to uh, talk about game one of the best of seven series. We'll also talk a little Jets offseason and CFL with Sarah Orleski before Murata Tesh of The Athletic joins us. Rod's got a real interesting piece on some draft possibilities for the Winnipeg Jets. And, of course, we'll maintain Trot's watch as it continues here in Winnipeg. And, hey, U.S. Open is underway. Round one at Brookline at the Country Club. Just saw Phil Mickelson tee off. Dubsy. That's all we need to say. Dubs is back, and he'll join us towards the end of the program as well for the latest from the U.S. Open. Uh, huge thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen, like our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, F Apparel, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Wallace & Wallace, Manitoba Battery, Culligan Water, Royal Sports, Breezy Bend, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, our friends at Assiniboia Downs, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course, our betting partners over at Cool Bet Canada. Let's get this show on the road and get Remus in here. Remo, what's going on? How about that game last night? What a game. What a game. Um, oh, I got to turn my lights on. One sec. Yeah, good idea. Good That's idea. probably a good way, idea. Way, to, way to be ready to roll for 1 p.m. We've only been working for two hours up until this point. No time to get the lights on. <laughs> I wonder if you had, did you actually have to like go leave your booth to go turn the lights on or uh... <laughs> I just had to stand up. I just had to stand up. Yeah. What a, what a night, uh, night one. I'm going to be honest, a three, one, I was like, uh, this game's done. I wish we had a close series. Uh, I thought this was going to be a lot closer, but, what? uh, I was totally wrong. I was like, well, I guess Colorado was just going to take this in four straight. It's, we're done. But, uh, full credit to Tampa battling back, uh, Sergachev with the floater, you know, get a, hey, just throw it on the net, get a stick on it. And I mean, both teams so good, so strong. Um, you know, we, and the, how about that crowd in Denver? I forgot Ooh. that people in Denver liked hockey. Uh, really exciting game one. I think that is exactly what you wanted going to overtime. And it wasn't, the TV networks are probably happy. And I know Craig Simpson was talking about uh, game one when Peter Klima scored like three, three overtimes. This was like minute 20 in, bam, it's done. You get, <laughs> Crowd went nuts. What a game. Well, and, and, and you know what? And Tampa was really pressing there in the OT. And and, and listen, and we'll get to this with Stormy in a little bit, but um, there's the relentless speed and forecheck of Colorado was really giving Tampa issues in their own end at times. And, you know, it just takes one turned over puck to end up in the back of the net. And it can happen just like that. And that's exactly what happened with the winner in overtime. Um, so I was really impressed with what the Avalanche did. That being said, I think that if you're on the Tampa side of things, you still have to be pretty confident that this team is going to have their say in this series, potentially in game number two. I mean, it starts off with the guy in net. Who was that guy playing in net in uh, the first period for Tampa? Because it didn't look like Vasilevsky. Wasn't uh, Mike Smith, was it? Was it, <laughs> it was Brian, Brian Elliott? Who was it? <laughs> um, we know Vasilevsky's the best, Huss, and he, he shut the door. But Colorado, I mean, they tried so hard in the third period, especially late. With that power play, I mean, watching the Colorado power play, how well they move the puck. Makar at the top, uh, McKinnon, who's coming in, Arturi Lekkinen, uh, what a trade that's proving to be. He's making an impact. Um, you know, some big uh, deadline deals. Uh, who Paul for Tampa as well with the with the fumble and then recover. I don't know if that was like an extremely skilled goal or an extremely lucky goal, the Paul one. But again, Colorado. Bit uh, of pre pressing on Vasilevsky. I know I'm all over the place here with my thoughts, but um, you know they eventually got one back, and at least it was a nice goal. 
in overtime. I mean, what a rocket shot on a broken play. And it was a broken play, but a beautiful pass from Nakushian, who's, you know, made definitely making an impact this year with Colorado after years kind of toiling away and with Dallas and the KHL. And he had that beauty pass, and Burkowski just buried it. So, a uh, great win for Colorado. And, but hey, we saw this from Tampa last series where we thought the series was done. They're not done, but they went down 2 nothing, and then they went back and won four straight. So I'm not closing the book here on anyone. Tampa, not done at all. And, and listen, I think from a Lightning standpoint, uh, they were much better overall in this game than they've been in a couple other game ones so far. Um, and Vasilevsky in particular. I mean, the, the numbers um, kind of speak for themselves as to how he's gotten better throughout series, I mean, especially after a couple of the series where they've lost the first game. Um, uh, the first period was incredible, though. I mean, if you thought that, and we've seen this before with the teams with the long layoffs, have had a little bit of a tough time getting into the series. Um, it certainly wasn't the case in the first period last night. Um, and I think I was one of the people that thought that that might be somewhat of an advantage for Tampa. Certainly we've seen it be that situation earlier in the playoffs. It wasn't last night at all. And my God, man, the speed of the avalanche not only in just the way that they're able to move the puck up and down the ice, but the speed at which they pass the puck around um, is just so elite. And, and when you have that talent on the club uh, or out on the ice, um, you know, even an incredibly stout defensive team like Tampa can be exposed. And it's all being led by Nate McKinnon last night, Remo. I don't know if you've seen these numbers with his number of shot attempts throughout this series. Travis Yost did an interesting piece on uh, on TSN.ca on it. 13 shot attempts in the game last night. And, you know, he's had 14, 14, 12, 10, 10, 12, 9, 8. I mean, he, he is, he's raised his level of play uh, and put, you know, a number of his teammates on his back at times that haven't been playing well, like Ranton and earlier on in the playoffs. Um, and he almost seems like a man possessed. Now, that's only going to get you so far, and this is the ultimate test in the Tampa Bay Lightning. But I'll say this about the Avalanche. They came ready to play. They were the better team last night, although what does it tell you that it still had to get done in overtime? Um, I'll tell you what, if this is any sign of what we're going to see the rest of this series, I think we are in for a doozy, and it wouldn't at all surprise me if we're talking about a game on a Tuesday night in a couple weeks, a seventh and deciding game to see who raises the Stanley Cup. Yeah, I do want to give a shout-out as well. I talk about a man possessed, Nikita Kucherov. He's made some passes these playoffs, especially in, what, the third period of a tied game, but it was yesterday, down 3-1, that pass he made to Andre Palat. Oh, boy. Uh, dangling around the defender, going through. Uh, that is, a, I mean, you have, I think that's the one thing about uh, these playoffs. You just have elite players going up against each other. You know, best. this is the best team in each, uh, in each conference. You don't have any, you know, look at some the past series of the salary cap area. You don't have Montreal squeaking in there or Dallas who was in there. You don't, you just don't have that here. This is two, this could be one of the best series. Uh, we've seen and definitely uh, period or game one lived up to all the hype. I do want to give a shout out. I know a lot of people angry about puck over glass. I mean, a tough penalty for Maroon to take, but hey, we all know puck over glass is a penalty. If there's a rolling puck in your own end, I don't know, maybe don't try to bank it off the boards. Maybe try to settle it down. We all know it's a, a Can rule. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. yeah. What the hell's Pat Maroon doing on the ice with 90 <laughs> seconds left hey. in a tie game in the cup final? They're deep teams. They're not afraid to play their fourth. That's what I happens guess. when you're a good team. You have a fourth line. You're not afraid to play. I don't know if you knew this. Pat Maroon, he's been he's been on the winning team for, uh, I think it's 15 straight series. <laughs> I think it's 15. I don't know if you knew that. He's won well, yeah, that's three what cups in a row. You win three. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that was in the game notes, I do believe. I, th I think mm -hmm. we've heard that mentioned so, once or twice. I, so I saw people saying, oh, puck over glass. And I agree, it's a, a bad penalty. But when the puck's bouncing... Don't or rolling on its side. Don't try to bank it off the board. That's not the play. And they got they almost got burned, but the Colorado ended up winning anyway. I, I've said this before on the program, but I'll say it again. I'm a big puck over glass guy. I think it's the best penalty in the National Hockey League. And some of you are saying, "What are you nuts?" The reason why I say that is there's absolutely no gray area. There's it's black and white. If you did it, you go to the box for two minutes. 
if it hits something, it's not, it's no problem. And listen, if you're worried about it going over, ice the puck. You, you can have the, you can have the puck, the, the face off in front of your own goaltender in your own end. Um, you know, there's a risk reward to it. We've seen it over and over again, but it couldn't be any more clear. Everybody knows the situation when you get in. Um, very different than many of the other penalties that at times are called and um, at times are let go. Um, and speaking of penalties last night, the one that I thought was a real turning point in the game, um, despite the fact that Tampa came back, was you know the penalty on Sorelli to give the Avalanche, what, a minute and a half, five on three in the first period. Um, listen, I mean, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about refs and whatnot, but um, I was shocked that in that scenario with a power play and a lead that that penalty was called. And um, I said to the guys I was watching the game with, this is going to go one of two ways. They're either going to score on this power play or uh, we're going to see a makeup call right away. Now at five on three, there's very few opportunities probably to call a penalty on the team that's up by two men. It didn't happen. Uh, And of course they got that power play goal in the two goal lead, but to Tampa's credit, they were right back in the game in fast order in the second period, and we got a heck of a third and an overtime winner, and uh, that's what I think everyone wanted to see, regardless of what side you're on uh, when we uh, when we went into this series with two titans of the game. Yeah, so don't count anyone out, even if it's a two-goal lead. That's There's a reason why it's the worst lead in hockey. Uh, so that's what they call it, even though it's more goals than a, a one-goal lead. But there they were yesterday, so I thought Colorado had this thing wrapped up in the first period, but bang, bang, but uh, you could say Tampa went bang, bang, right? To use a shout out Dennis, Dennis Bayak. To use a Dennis Bayak uh, ism. So again, great game. It was I do want to give a shout out to myself. I want to give myself a Barry Horowitz pat on the back. This is my story. Um, we ran out of bananas. I needed to get some bananas during the game uh, because my son gets a chocolate milk uh, smoothie every morning. So third period ends. I zip out to the grocery store. I'm like, this is pretty risky between third period and overtime. Can I get back? I go, I'm running in. I didn't even know it was raining. Get my shopping done. Did the self-checkout. That's key. Self-checkout. Not waiting in line. I'm pro at that. Veteran Ra- move. Veteran move. Race home. I have the game on Sirius XM. Get into the house. I didn't even turn off my tablet. I had the game playing on a tablet. I say, oh, great. I got here. One minute in into the game. Awesome. I didn't miss anything. Put my headphone in. Bam. As soon as I get in, Burakovsky buries the winner. So I was so relieved that I didn't miss the game for going to get groceries during the intermission. It's uh, a dangerous a, move. It was dangerous. But it was well executed. I just have a quick self-checkout question for you. Yeah. And listen, I have not spent very much time in grocery stores over the last number of months. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that out right, right there. Although I have used self-checkout, but usually I'm just putting through like Diet Pepsi and frozen pizzas and things that are already packaged. What's the, how do you self-checkout bananas or produce? Like, oh. what's the, what happens? Do you have to know a special number? I mean, yeah. it just seems very confusing. I would normally go if I had anything from produce, I would probably go to an actual teller. No, there's a sticker on the button. So you go look up code, you just type in the code, or you just say there's no, there's a button on the thing that says no barcode and you can look it up. It's pretty easy. I punched in the code yesterday. It's had the sticker. Yeah, you got to punch it. I don't know them off by heart. I'm not like those pro uh, checkout people, but uh, they have the sticker on. It's pretty good. I just, you know, this is great. You know, hearing Remus's grocery store endeavors. I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if by next year, with your growing profile, you might end up as maybe featured on. Is there, isn't there a show Extreme Couponing? Can yeah, out we, there, know, we You know, we, going head to head with a bunch of veteran, veteran shoppers that know the ins and outs of the coupon game. I'd love to see you get in there and, uh, you know, be be a be a featured personality on uh, a grocery store type show. I'm not a big coupon guy. Uh, And shout out to Stefan, who knows the code for bananas, 4011. But that's in the U.S. You can, like, (laughs) stack. In the U.S., you can stack coupon on coupon. You can't do that here. There's there's rules against how many coupons you can use. Uh, So I will say that about couponing. I see, I see. Well, anyways, there's enough of our grocery store, uh, yeah. grocery store segment no one wants today to on hear the that. program. Oh, I'm sure they do. There's lots of comments in the in the chat. Search functional teach us. Thanks, Ritz. Hey, Carter Chen's in the house. What's up, CC? Um, 
Okay, well, we're going to talk more about the game with Marat. And as I mentioned, Stormy Wanna Tony coming up in uh, just a few minutes from VEASAN as well. But, Remo, let's get to the latest update of Trot's Watch. We have no news for you, people. Barry Trotz has not been hired by anybody, including the Winnipeg Jet this, this time. Um, but I'll tell you what, maybe let's get to the Elliot Friedman uh, clip first, Reem, because, uh, of course, Friedman and Jeff Merrick, and, you know, throughout the playoffs have been uh, podcasting, usually after games. And uh, today, we always check in on 32 Thoughts to see if there's any of the latest from one of the best insiders in the game in Elliot Friedman. And he had uh, uh, you know, an update that said the Jets are certainly still in it, but... There is very much a question as to when this situation is rectified one way or the other. Here's Elliot Friedman in a conversation with Jeff Merrick from uh, earlier today. Any of what's happening behind the bench? I believe that the Panthers... Oh, wait, sorry. That, that's not the right... One sec. I edited it, I swear. That was the lengthy one. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Hold on. That was the wrong... That was the wrong... Is Jeff Hamilton is still wondering? Yes, everyone is still wondering. Um, because, and here's the thing I mean, at, you know, at the beginning of it all, I think that we were probably more concerned uh, about, you know, the Philadelphia Flyers throwing $7 million at Barry Trotz, which has been reported, and, you know, and going that way. Vegas Golden Knights is another team that, you know, has a pretty darn good roster, pretty nice place to live, um, that would be an attractive spot for any NHL coach. Well, they've gone with Bruce Cassidy. Um, certainly, as Friedman's been reporting since last week, and again, even uh, more steadfast that Peter DeBoer is sounds like the choice of the Dallas Stars, and they're discussing that gig as well. Um, and the Detroit Red Wings are out there, and what he was mentioning about the Florida Panthers uh, was that reportedly the Panthers have been, you know, having some conversations with some coaches out there. Now, Barry Trotz wasn't mentioned by name at all, um, but it really does seem like the Jets continue to be all in on Barry Trotz. But, um, you know, at this point, it has not been done yet. Here's the clip we were looking for from Elliot Friedman with Jeff Merrick. Unless Trotz shows up here, Boston sure looks like they're trending younger or fresher. There, there's no question about that. You know, when people are going to ask me about Winnipeg, I just don't think we have a clear answer yet on trots. I think Vegas knew he wasn't ready. Philly knew he wasn't ready. And I think Winnipeg's got a shot here as we do this on Wednesday night. I'm just not sure what the timeline is. All right. So that's a little different than, you know, what Elliot had said, I guess on the weekend, or maybe was it on Monday that he thought that there might be something happening mid to later on this week. Well, we're later on this week right now. It's Thursday. Um, you know, something obviously could happen on Friday or potentially early this week. I know, all of the teams are very careful not to, you know, have big announcements and, you know, try not to make big news, you know, during the Stanley Cup final. But I think during, it, certainly on game days of the Cup final, but this would be a day afterwards with two days in between games that, you know, might be time to do it. Bottom line is we haven't heard anything like that. Um, that being said, Reem, uh, Winnipeg still certainly is in the mix. And for us here at Winnipeg Sports Talk and certainly for Jet fans, um, the vigil continues, I guess it's safe to say, and um, we have no clarity, but we'll continue being here and talking about it each and every day till we know one way or the other. For the crowd who uh, says there's no announcements, I mean, Vegas had their big introductory press conference for Bruce Cassidy uh, in, you know, to announce him as head coach. So you did have some news, and now it is an off day, as you mentioned, so maybe on Stanley Cup off days, because we're getting close. Free agency is coming up. You're gonna team players are gonna want to know who the head coach is. So that was the news for Barry Trotz. I don't know. He seems to be waiting on something. I don't know what the holdup is here. Is he waiting on um, you know Florida to become an option because Elliot was saying how they're kind of you know haven't given Andrew well, this, Brunette from the sounds a, a of thing. it. And Hamilton mentioned this last night. I mean, I think there is a question as to you know, whether he does want to be behind the bench this year. I mean, it's hard to ignore the fact that the Islanders own 4 million bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could literally, you know, grab a cocktail and kick it on a beach for the next year and be paid as if he was an NHL head coach. So, I mean, that's certainly a hurdle. Um, but certainly we've done all we can. It sounds like the Jets are doing all they can. And, uh, you know, fingers crossed there'll be a great resolution. The one that I think the vast majority of Winnipeg Jet fans are hoping for. And that's Barry Trotz to be the new head coach for the Jets. But at the same time, you know that they're working uh, behind the scenes as well on some other options if it doesn't go their way. But 
from all accounts. Uh, and listen, there has been some optimistic voices. There has been some ones that say sort of pump the brakes. So listen, I'm still optimistic. I mean, the fact that the Jets are still in it and mentioned in the contention for Barry Trotz after all of this waiting, I think is positive, especially with other jobs being filled. Uh, but for those of you that think it's just a matter of time before an announcement, I don't think that we are quite there yet. One thing I can tell you, Remo, is that our offer, along with our friends at Little Brown Jug, continues to get a ton of run. We talked about it appearing. There you go. Nice uh, nice new shirt. Yeah, I got a new uh, crew neck. There you yeah. go. Uh, we talked about it uh, ending up in that German newspaper yesterday, uh, but maybe the best little bit of publicity was uh, on ESPN with the NHL panel and our guy Bucci Gross yesterday. Yeah, this was on their Stanley Cup preview show. At the end, they did a rundown of the coaches, and here is John Bucci Gross uh, giving a shout out to Winnipeg. Here it is. So a lot going on. Speaking of the Jets, they want their boy Barry Trotz to come back in the worst of way, the Stanley Cup winning head coach. And they, they've gone so far, Barry, to offer him free beer for life. Trotz, would not take at least seven or eight. <laughs> That's not enough. That could be the difference. That could be the tipping point. He's a great Trotz. guy. Whoever gets him is going to love him. With Bucci and the boys, and uh, we should thank Bucci because we did tweet that uh, that out, and then uh, he cranked it out to about what a four hundred thousand followers uh, yesterday to uh, let people know that the vigil continues and the offer is still on the table for uh, for Coach Barry. Oh yeah, I re I tweeted that out uh, on our account, so check it out, Sports Talk WPG, if you missed it, and that's uh, John Butragos with Barry Melrose. I think Kevin Weeks on, but my favorite part was seeing this picture. And the thing at the bottom there, Winnipeg Brewery offers Barry Trotz free beer for life to coach Jets. <laughs> and then it says Trotz from, and this picture at the bottom with Barry Trotz's face next to the Jets logo, it just looks like it fits uh, to me. This is, this is just beautiful uh, right I'll, here. I'll say this. one thing, regardless of how this ends up, it's been a lot of fun for us. It's obviously been great for our friends over at Little Brown Jug. And people are talking about the Jets around the National Hockey League mm -hmm. and maybe in some other places that they wouldn't normally be talking about hockey at all. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great story so far, but it becomes a hell of a lot better if we can actually follow through on the offer. And Barry Trotz does become the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. We'll get Marat uh, Tesh's thoughts on the Trotz watch and the coaching situation around the league, as well as a look ahead to the NHL draft a little later on when he joins us. As I mentioned, Sarah Orleski's jumping on the program as well. But in just a minute, we're going to welcome in Vise and Stormy Bonatoni, our friend Gary Lawless's former co-worker with the Vegas Golden Knights. Before we do that, though, I want to give a big shout out to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. Hey, summer is here, folks. And Vita Health, seven Winnipeg locations, has you covered with great prices on Winnipeg's best selection of natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries. And listen, the groceries are incredible. Their items in the grab and go deli, phenomenal. I mean, healthy, fast, delicious lunches options, including Vita Market salads, soups, sandwiches, and more. Uh, very popular falafel salad. And of course, with barbecue season here, and get your barbecue on with things like delicious lean bison steaks and chicken at your local Vita Health Fresh Market. And hey, speaking of barbecues, Vita Health is hosting their block party and barbecue Saturday, June 25th. So that's a week this Saturday. Mark it down, gang, 11 to 1 p.m. at their Linden Ridge location, 1751 Keniston Boulevard. Be real fun for the whole family. Face painting, games, product samples, and a free lunch. We're going to be there as well. So uh, make sure you pop by and check that out. And listen, if you can't make it into the store, you can also visit their brand new fully shoppable website to buy online or schedule a delivery or in-store pickup. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. That was seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. Uh, hey, our gang, the gang of Wallace and Wallace is busy this summer, uh, but they can take care of you if you need, if you have needs in fencing or with your overhead door, because they've been the specialists in Winnipeg for over 75 years. If you need a new fence or if winter did a number on your old one, they've got you covered with vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood fencing. And if it's time to replace your garage door, they've also got Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors. 452-2700. 
The gang at Wallace will arrange a timeout to give you a free estimate. You can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. And uh, hey, just locked in our trip to Aikens Lake. Going to be going in early August. Cannot wait for it. And my God, every time I see Pitt and the gang firing out some pictures of the fish they're pulling out of the lake there at Aikens, I get more excited. If you've been thinking about maybe a special trip, Maybe not too far from home. You can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg in basically paradise on earth with the incredible group of people, including the Turan family, running the spot. Find out more at AkinsLake.com or on Twitter and the socials at Aikens Lake. And uh, hey, big dinner next week. Emmett Smith coming in. Looking forward to hanging with Matt Libel and uh, being there at the Rady Center JCC dinner. It'll be the first time in a long time people have maybe put a suit on. Uh, of course, every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. And the boys at F Apparel have you covered with custom suits beginning at just $400, not to mention an incredible array of menswear at great prices. Pop down and see them at 190 Smith Street. And if you're in a wedding, having a wedding, talk them about a great deal for the wedding party where you can get your suits made at F Apparel and save 15% off for the entire wedding party. They're at 190 Smith Street downtown. You can check them out online at F, that's E P phapparel.com. All right, what a game last night in the Stanley Cup final. Let's head to Vegas right now and talk about it with Vizen's Stormy Bonatoni. Stormy, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to have you on the program. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. And I got to tell you right off the top, very impressed with my last name pronunciation that you got it because I swear to you, I can tell people a thousand times and they'll still call me Butanami. So <laughs> very impressed. Thank you. <laughs> now, listen, before we talk about that amazing start to the cup final, I have to ask you, and, and many people would be familiar with you uh, for your work with the Vegas Golden Knights on their broadcast. Can you confirm or deny that your move to VEASAN was necessitated by you just not being able to handle Gary Lawless anymore. <laughs> That's great. No, I love Gare Bear. I probably can't hang with him on the road, though. He's uh, he's He's got that down pat for sure. Oh, Bobby uh, Big I, Wheel. Yeah, I'll never forget the when COVID first happened and we were all in Minnesota um, on a road trip and we thought that the next day's game was going to get canceled, but we weren't sure yet. And Gary was like, Stormy, it's okay. You can have a beverage. And I was like, I, I don't know, Gary. We might have a game tomorrow. We're not going to have a game tomorrow, Stormy. I promise you can have one. Gary, I'm not sure. Stormy, go. <laughs> so one of the best uh, as from a broadcaster, writer, friend, and um, encouraging drinking partner as well. Yeah, no, he is, uh, he's an absolute beauty, of course. Uh, people around here remember us doing those shows for uh, so long together, and obviously he still pops on. But, I mean, it's more than just Gary, to be honest. I mean, we always joke about the Manitoba Mafia there in Vegas. I mean, starting with Kelly McCrae, Crimin, but um, of course, Gary and our guy, Shane Knighty, who I understand is going to be on your show, uh, My Guys in the Desert on VEASAN. Yes, super excited. Um, it, that's one of the great things about you know, still being here in town and still having such great friendships with all those guys. Shane's going to come on my show today. He covered the abs very closely when he was covering the Stanley Cup playoffs on TNT this postseason and obviously knows the abs very, very well in general. But he's got his Stanley Cup pedigree as well, being on that 2011 team with the Bruins. So pumped to have Shane. I love that we have all these connections right now. This is awesome. Those are some of my favorite people in the world. Well, and of course, you're right there at the Circa. And, uh, you know, we were just down in Vegas about a month ago, just down the street doing the show at the D, but I went and checked out. You guys have quite the HQ there at uh, at Circa. And if anyone hasn't been there, get downtown because it is absolutely unbelievable. When are you going to start doing the show from, from Stadium Swim? Oh, we've done it before. I'm not <laughs> even kidding. Uh, during the NFL draft, Circa hosted a few players. So we got to do some stuff up at Stadium Swim. Kayvon Thibodeau, who uh, was the number four selection to the New York Giants, was up there. We did interviews with him and a couple other players up there. It's a it's a party all over this building. As you can see, the sports book behind me, it's the biggest sports book in the world. The screen's out here. The screen's at Stadium Swim. Even the screen on the hotel on the outside as you're driving by, you can watch the game or watch whatever it's it is a very unique awesome spot and also just like if you're coming to vegas and you want good people watching it's right here on fremont like the best people watching in the city right over here that's so funny you mentioned that i was at stadium swim for 
night one of the draft, saw the Thibodeau party, and I yeah. thought, well, that looks like story. I'm not sure. Well, sure enough, it was you. Well, listen, it's great to have you on the program. Let's get to it, though. I know you, like everyone that's involved in hockey, we're completely, just legitimately excited for this final. I don't think we could have had a better matchup in ages in the National Hockey League, and uh, man, did game one deliver last night. Absolutely. I'm sad I didn't think through. I have a blow up like inflatable giant life size replica of the Stanley Cup. It's over there. So I won't run off and grab it. But next time I'll make sure that I have it on deck. But absolutely like the storylines coming into the Stanley Cup final as well, knowing that you have the two time defending Stanley Cup champion in the Tampa Bay Lightning that's been here before. They have the experience, the grit, the will. They want to establish this dynasty versus a Colorado Avalanche team that has been so close, but so snake bitten the last couple of years and I remember working for the Knights last season when the abs year came to an end to Vegas and hearing some of those post-game press conference words from Nathan McKinnon and talking about what they need to do to take that next step and how just absolutely heartbroken and devastated they were to finally get to this point is so special and with the pieces that they have to get to this point and then they go out and win game one and so much of the the argument coming into this game and I'm mad because obviously I work at a betting network so I bet on the game yesterday and I did take Tampa uh, at the plus money price as the underdog for game one banking on the abs coming out with a slow start, right? They had nine days rest. They're going to be a little bit rusty. We saw that happen to Tampa against the Rangers. I totally bought into that storyline. And I was obviously very wrong with the 3-1 first period. The abs came out hot, showed no rust. But Tampa did Tampa things to get back into the game and eventually force overtime. And it's a great game. Props to Andre Burakovsky for being able to score that game winner in overtime. I think he deserved that goal. Happy for him to get it. Um, just sad for my bankroll. Yeah, well, listen, I was right there with you. Um, but, I mean, that game, it really did turn. And Tampa seemed to be more like Tampa that we expected as the game went on. And even in overtime, I mean, that was sort of when they were really flexing. But, man, the relentless pressure in the neutral zone and the forecheck of the Avalanche continued to you know, frustrate and cause some turnovers. And it was that one turnover you know, against a team like Colorado that can be the difference. And that's exactly what happened last night in OT. Yeah, exactly. And oh, man, I, I thought that we might have gotten that Patrick Maroon goal there late after the power play. I was, <laughs> ooh, I was very much so thinking that we had it. And then, yeah, one thing leads to another and Colorado goes on to win in the fashion that they do. Something that really stood out to me um, that, that if anybody's watched the Colorado Avalanche in person that doesn't come across as well on television, I think, is the speed with which they play. They just look so fast out there on the ice. And that was something I was paying close attention to yesterday from a distance. I was like, mm. today you can even see it, especially if you're looking for it. You're like, oh, my goodness, just the relentless pressure that this team does have. And then you have a guy in Andre Vasilevsky, who we know is, of course, the, the best goaltender in the world right now. And he has an off performance to start the game. But he settled back in, too, which I think is going to be really important in the series moving forward. Yeah, he looked like Mike Smith in the first period. And then all of a sudden <laughs> he turned back into Andre Vasilevsky and we had a game on. I still I, can't I, get over that. Sorry to interject. <laughs> but the fact that Mike Smith could make some of these heroic saves and then let one in from 130 feet behind the other blue line. Like, I just, how does this happen? What are we doing? It, it, listen, I do a, a, a show with uh, one of the guys out in Edmonton, and it was just a constant topic. I mean, no matter how good and all the amazing saves he made, there was always, you know, one stinker or more that were going in. And it was sort of incredible the way they were able to beat the Flames. Um, but, you know, going up, you need more against the Avalanche. And to be honest, we know we'll see more from Andre Vasilevsky and the Tampa Bay Lightning. And I don't know. I mean, if you're sitting on a Tampa Bay series, I bet I think you still have to be feel pretty good because they weren't their best early on. Colorado was unreal. And you talked about the speed. They were relentless. They were passing like the Harlem Globetrotters at times in that first period last night. And this game still went down to basically a coin flip in OT. Um, I would imagine that we'll see an even better Tampa team. And uh, listen, I just can't wait to see game two, considering the way things started up last night. No, I agree. And I, I might go back to the well and try to Tampa target a plus money price again. They're valued around the same as we saw in game one, where Colorado is like a minus 150 favorite Tampa plus 130 plus 140 in that range. And if you want to buy in on Tampa for the series, this might be a good opportunity too if you think that they're going to bounce back because they're over plus 200 value. I think they're at three to one odds right now. Um, but yeah, Tampa was held to below two expected goals in that game for the first time all postseason. And 
only 23 shots on goal, which is their lowest shot total in all of these playoffs. Like this is, this is uncharacteristic for that team. And Andre Vasilevsky, like I mentioned, it was uncharacteristic for him to allow three goals on the first 15 shots of a game. It's the first time in his career he's done anything like that. So you know that he's going to settle in. He did throughout the course of that game, ended up with 34 saves, uh, went over his saves prop on the night. But I keep on looking at the game once for Andre Bas- Vasilevsky this postseason. He's one in three with just a tick under four goals. Uh, against allowed with an 884 save percentage and the rest of the way in this postseason he's 11 and 3 190 goals against 939 save percentage we know what vintage Bazzi is and what he has and I think that he's going to come out and just as a team they're going to come out as a better collective core yeah well I will be looking at some of those uh, you know maybe under props for the home team in game one because in game two because we know the way that they bounce back Stormy Bonatoni is with us from Vizen. Um, I've got to ask you, man, I know you've been all over the cup final. You said you got Shane on. Tell us a little bit about uh, the show and where people can find the content and what's going on at Vizen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go to vison.com, vison.com slash subscribe. Um, in addition to all of our live streaming and daily video content that we have, which is also available on audio platforms on iHeart and uh, wherever you download your podcast. So if you miss a show live, you can download and listen on your own time for every single show that we have here on the network. Uh, but we have daily articles, Point Spread Weekly, which break down, breaks down all of the upcoming events and different angles and perspectives, not only from sides and totals, but props. And my show specifically is kind of just a, a fast paced, fun, a little bit knucklehead goofy, just because that is who I am as a human being, um, all wrapped up into one. And it's a lot of fun. We focus in a lot on the NHL because that's my background, as is the NFL um, and college football. So those are kind of my three primary sports that we dive the deepest into. But we're hitting on everything that's going on daily as well. So Major League Baseball is in full swing of the regular season right now. So doing daily games that we have interest in, obviously the NBA final uh, going on right now as well. Game six coming up. We'll see who it is, Warriors or Celtics. But we dive into a little bit of everything uh, with a little bit of a, a unique storminess to it, I guess. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been so much fun having you on the program. Hopefully we can do this again soon at some point. Um, thanks so much. Enjoy game number two and uh, all the best in your new home at Vizen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Oh, man, real fun chat with Stormy. Uh, we'll look forward to having her back on the show sometime as well. And big thanks to Greg McIsaac. We've been working on that for a couple of weeks to get set up. And uh, great to have it happen today. Uh, Sarah Lesky on deck, Marotta Tesh, and a little U.S. Open chat at the end of the program with our guy Dubs. Uh, do want to thank Culligan Water, though. Kenny was on yesterday. The well-hydrated cannon met with the amount of amount of miles he traveled during the interview he had needed to be check that out we posted on the youtube if you missed ken's hit with us yesterday it was uh quite something certainly from a visual perspective if you're with us on youtube um but the gang of culligan water uh locally owned family business have been hydrating our province for over 65 years um and they've got everything that you need in the water game softeners filters bottled water coolers whole home systems and drinking water systems citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Pop down and see them at 1200 Sargent Avenue. You can get them at 694-5180 or check them out online at drinkculligan.com. Uh, we're going to have a hot weekend coming up. Finally, a little bit of summer-like weather around here. And listen, if you want to make the most of the weekend, um, take advantage of Manitoba Batteries. Extended spring and summer hours open till 8 p.m., Hit it, hit it up during the week afterwards and get batteries for everything to dominate the summer. Whether we're talking boats, sea maybe you're working on a hot rod, you've got a golf cart that gets you around from campsite to campsite. Manitoba Battery has literally every sort of battery. And the best part is you'll be shopping local and you'll save big time, both time and money from the big box stores like Costco and Canadian Tire. Pop down and see Donnie and his great staff at 1026 Logan Avenue or give them a call at 783-8787. They'll hook you up, get everything you need, have it ready for you to go quick and easy with a fast pickup over at Manitoba Battery. And of course, you can also find out everything they've got for you at Manitoba battery.com and oh i watched the game last night with greg from royal sports uh we are working on maybe some more unique new era where uh, winnipeg sports talk merch we'll let you know about that probably happen into the fall uh but when it comes to licensed merchandise for your favorite team royal sports has it all winnipeg jets winnipeg blue bombers but 
all teams throughout the National Hockey League. You want to jump on a bandwagon of the Lightning or Avs? They've got you covered with that as well. Not to mention the NBA, Blue Jays and Major League Baseball, the National Football League and more. But it's so much more than just the coolest selection of merchandise. A massive bike selection for the summer. They're the hockey superstore 12 months a year, uh, but now extend, er, expanded soccer section as well as softball, baseball, and a ton of new disc golf equipment as well for the summer. Pop down. Give yourself a little bit of time to shop everything that they've got at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway, and check them out on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and upcoming sales. All right, Marat coming up in a few minutes, but let's welcome in our good friend Sarah Orleski for her thoughts on the Jets and, of course, the kickoff to CFL season. What's going on? How are you? I am so excited. I think this is the first time that I have been on the show. So I'm going to call you out for that. I think it is. So if well, listen, I'm call I, we won't you get to we won't get to right details. Now. I'm not sure whether Remus has your wrong number or something, but yeah, uh, we're, we had to Michael go. Michael Remus and I are going to have a have a talk later <laughs> we, on. We, we, you this. know what? You know your your large management team. There's like so many barriers <laughs> to getting so through to the, the, the oh. Orleski <laughs> direct line. Uh, but it's great that uh, it finally happened. How are you? I mean, busy again. I mean, you were everywhere last weekend. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, CFL, we're into week two, and it was a very busy week one. I uh, had the chance to do three games in three days, which uh, you don't have the chance to do that often. So it was um, it was a lot of fun being able to do that and just getting back into the swing of things. I, mean, I, I love CFL, um, as I know you guys do as well. And so the opportunity to be outside again and just have football back and – starting earlier than ever is is great well i mean for all of us just getting back to ig field and seeing the champs out there again was great and i mean you by the way congratulations you were amazing in that ceremony and, and it was perfect i mean i think the night was so great the crowd was good people were fired up obviously celebrating another great cup championship uh blowing the fireworks and the smoke and then getting out there and that of course was the probably for a lot of people that may have missed the preseason game the last time they were in ig field since the legendary freezing game in the West final between the Bombers and the Riders. And I mean, you've covered this for a long time, just big picture. It's just amazing to see the turnaround of this organization over the course of the last five years. And now the Bombers being the team to beat and uh, a big party celebrating another great cup that you, of course, were uh, emceeing. Absolutely. I, when you think about the tumultuous years that, that were not too long ago, really, I mean, in the big picture, uh, when it comes to the Bombers and that now they are just the picture of stability in the CFL and credit to, I mean, credit starts with Wade Miller not making changes with Kyle Walters and Mike O'Shea uh, when the pressure was on that I think a lot of people outside the organization wondered whether or not he would continue to give them the opportunity to build something here because the natural inclination, I think when things don't go well right off the hop is for people to say, okay, well, how are we going to change this? But you've got to be able to give them time to do it. And you look at what the results have been. And then it's just continued to grow. And the atmosphere inside IG Field, I, the opportunity, obviously, to visit most of the stadiums around the CFL. And IG Field, there's something so special about it. Um, and I'm not just saying that being, obviously, from Winnipeg. But just the passion that people have. I mean, you mentioned the West Final. It was unbelievable i just that to me would to be honest um goes past many of the great cups that i've been in just atmospheres where i wish that i had been in the crowd because i would love to have been singing along with everyone Huss, <laughs> which i'm sure that you were um but having that sort of environment that they've created there now it's something where i think that you whether you're a hardcore football fan or you're just looking for a good time in a night out an event in the city that ig field is is a place that you want to be in in the cfl season well and we had a hell of a football game too i mean full credit <sighs> to the ottawa red blacks i mean that didn't look anything like the team that was at the bottom of the standings last year and a uh, little bit of drama drew brown coming uh, off the bench to win the game and um i mean listen winners win and the bombers show they have that championship pedigree uh, but for the Ottawa Red Blacks, I mean, have to almost be kicking themselves for some missed opportunities. And it sets up a very interesting rematch between the teams coming up on Friday night. Well, and I think it's so it's so great for the league to have the Red Blacks. And you think about it, I had the Red 
Blacks looking like they're going to be back and being a competitive this season. The, they obviously were for the first, you know, half, five years that they were in or math is always off with me now because of COVID. I'm lucky that I know that it's 2022. But the you think of the success that they had when they returned to the league. And then obviously two straight seasons of, with just three wins. The, this is a league. It's a nine-team league. They need to have parity. They can't have teams struggle and market struggle the way that Ottawa did. So I think that it was great for um, Ottawa fans and for the CFL fans to see that Ottawa is going to be out there competing. And it's also a reminder that as dominant as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers were last season, and I'm not saying that they can't be dominant. And I mean, they're the cream of the crop going in this year as well. I just don't think it's going to be, it'll be more challenging for them to be as dominant in 2022 as they were in 2021. I think that we've seen a number of changes to different teams and you got it as you mentioned I mean it's not that wasn't the team that everyone was used to seeing after 2021 just in terms of whether it be dominating the line or you saw I mean some of um that secondary get exposed the offense didn't move the same sort of way that you're expecting but it was week one most important thing was they found a way to win and and the that extra element of Drew Brown coming in and orchestrating that drive and then Legio with the kick after missing extra point. I mean, it was just, it was high drama for it, which is when the atmosphere at IG field is the best. Um, and it certainly uh, makes for an interesting rematch this week in Ottawa. No doubt about it. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about what went well for the Bombers, what needs to get better. And certainly the running game wasn't at the Bombers standard. Um, so, you know, they'll look to see what Brady Oliveric and Johnny Augustine can do. Uh, but of course they're filling in the, you know, the shoes of a legend in Andrew Harris, who's going to make his Argos debut tonight. You've covered Andrew for a long time. What do you think we're going to see from Harris? I imagine he always played with a chip on his shoulder. I think there's going to be a boulder on his shoulder when we see him out there in double blue beginning tonight. I think so too. And and I look, I do. I think that there's still you know, gas left in the tank for Andrew. Absolutely. I, I do. I think it'll be interesting to see though. I'm so intrigued. I find that, you know, I mean, Andrew was obviously the back here for so many years. And so it's tough to say, but I think that it'll be interesting to see what the offensive line is able to open up for him as well. Cause that's one of the keys that you look at as fantastic as he is. He obviously benefited as well from having that great line in front of him here in Winnipeg. So what is he able to do in Toronto? But I think it, it gives Toronto a, opportunity and dimensions that they didn't have before just because of the skill set that that he has there is no doubt as you mentioned that it'll be a boulder sized chip because anyone that's doubting andrew harris or him wanting to show everyone that he should have still um been here i think he'll he'll want to prove that tonight it'll be interesting to see how he gets off now it, it seemed like you were on tsn non-stop that last weekend you did three and three <laughs> i mean are they gonna run you like that all season long sarah I hope not. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> there is at one point. So after the bombers game started, um, it, so it started late, obviously because of the unveiling um, of the banner. And so I had two and a half hours sleep before I had to get up and fly for the game that was in Regina the next day. So it is not easy. If anyone has not, if anyone hasn't been flying um, since the pandemic, a lot of the different routes that we had out of Winnipeg no longer exist. So it's a little bit more of a family circus sort of <laughs> path that one must take. You know, like the little footsteps that went all around the map everywhere. That's what I feel like now. So in order to get to Regina, you have to go to Calgary. And I'm actually, I'm in Edmonton this week. And I have to go Winnipeg, Calgary, Calgary, Edmonton in order to get there. So it makes things just a little bit more adventurous <laughs> when's tsn gonna step up and get your own private bird i mean we gotta take care of our people the, here i want the madden bus that was what i was joking <laughs> yes. you know our guys the orleski guys, cruiser yes <laughs> come on how great would that be i had i had people um or you know they did they made a joke about it on the broadcast air it was air sarah um with all of my different flights for it they said no i I'm a big, I love driving anyways. I don't want to drive the cruiser. Let me make that clear. But 
I would love to be on it. You can work, you could just, you know, you finish a game, you drive through the night. That man was brilliant for many reasons. John Madden's cruiser, I just, I think it's a missed opportunity that our CFL on TSN crew does not travel by cruiser. Madden. Can't you just imagine us or, I mean, whether it be, you know, Dwayne Ford, Dust Nielsen, uh, when Matt Dunnigan does it and just traveling through the prairies or the mountains on our on our cruise. I want the whole crew with me. That yeah, if you have great. Dusty on it, just know he'll be doing four hours of morning radio and then three more podcasts afterwards. And, uh, you know, he might have 20 minutes to have a quick chat over the course of like nine or 10 hours. I don't know if he has more hours in his day than the rest of us. And he's somehow figured out a way to adjust, you know, the um, time because I can't figure out how that man is, he's constantly on my feed. It's exactly what you said. It's always a radio show. It's a podcast. And I've tried to get him to actually, I've suggested on numerous occasions now, but he also incorporates some of the costumes that I think he sometimes wears on his radio oh, show. Oh, the Tales of Game the North? Of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Tales of the North. <laughs> and it needs to somehow incorporate that into CFLs. So just keep it with him so that that way, if say a game um, turns out to be a blowout or something like that, that he brings it, he brings it out, adds a little bit of, you know, you know fly that flair. up the flagpole to PG. Tell him Dusty should that. start doing the Tales of the North, setting up all of the games in the Canadian Football League each week. I guarantee you <laughs> it would be a huge hit for television viewers and CFL fans coast to coast. Could you imagine? I think it's great. I was actually, I was joking with him last week. I wish I could remember exactly what it was. Like, I don't think it was a hat with the spinning top on it, but it was something that I had said to him. Said, you know, you should really, you should add that to the repertoire as well. <laughs> don't, don't just do your, uh, don't just do your one costume. You got to well, expand. The, the funny thing is, guys like uh, him and us that you know talk about this stuff day to day. The minute the pandemic hit and you were still on the air for three and four hours a day with no sports, you had to get creative and had to learn how to have some fun with some things. And I don't know if anybody did it better than started Dusty. From? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, right. There's a whole bunch of things. Oh, we were, we started, we like, we were doing our drafts, uh, you know, of uh, the pandemic grocery draft, uh, taking frozen pizza, number one, whatnot. We ended up doing that daily. I would come on or weekly, come on, do a weekly draft and a bunch of stuff. But yeah, as far as a grinder and a hard worker, there's no one, uh, no one like him. And man, he's doing a great job with the, I mean, the entire CFL team just seems to be um, so well healed. And and it also, to be honest, it seems like both on camera and off, you guys have a lot of fun working with each other. We do. It is such, I always describe it um, as being my CFL on TSN family. Um, and we do, we have a great time. And so many of us, I mean, Dustin's new to the, to the team and is fit right in. And, but so many of us have been um, doing this with TSN for so many years for it. So you have so many stories and go back, but it's just, it's a fantastic crew. There's so many laughs with it. And, you know, there's, there are a few people that you would want to hang out with more than, than that group. Cause they're just, Yeah. They're fantastic people. Sarah Lesky is with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Sarah, we can't have you on without talking about this Jets offseason, which is, I mean, as interesting and as many storylines as maybe the last five offseasons combined. Um, first off, what do you make of the coaching search right now? I mean, obviously, we've heard the name Barry Trotz. Some of us trying to we have. you know, get get us over the finish line. Cassidy's gone to Vegas. Uh, it sounds like Tort's going to Philadelphia. Um, what do you make of the, first of all, the choice the Winnipeg Jets have to make, uh, their number one target, and how important it is to get that coach in before a number of very impactful moves could be made by the general manager? I had totally been oblivious to the fact that Barry Trotz was number one <laughs> on most people's lists. <laughs> nicely, well, first off, nicely done to you, you two. Credit for um, for all of the for all of the extra <laughs> attention that you've been able to bring to it. But it is all anybody, as I'm sure you know, Hus, from being out. I can only imagine how many times people stop you. It's all anyone wants to talk about, and it's all anyone wants to know is not even who are they going to hire it's is it going to be Barry how soon do you think it could be Barry I had someone tell me that they thought there should be a parade at Portage in Maine if Barry signs no they don't need to actually win any games just if he signs he deserves his own parade 
And then uh, it, just walking around everywhere, people want to come up, ah, hi. So uh, Barry Trotz, what do you think the odds are that Barry's going to sign here? How great would it be? So um, and from all of the t-shirts, from all of the free beer or newspapers <laughs> that I saw in Dauphin and, and everything, I mean, whether he ends up um, coming to Winnipeg or not. I think that the job that Winnipeg fans have done, uh, I would think that Barry would be quite quite amused by it and quite flattered, quite flattered by it. But it will be interesting to see. And I think that now that you start to see the dominoes fall in other markets with coaches um, being hired, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not Barry makes a decision soon, regardless of if it's coaching here, if, he's, if he elects not to coach this year and maybe – um, either stays out or pursues something in management because we know that that talk has been something that has been around there a lot. If it doesn't turn out to be a coach, Barry Trotz, I think it'll be very interesting because I think it tells us a lot about the way that the Winnipeg Jets view themselves, the type of coach that they bring in here, whether or not it's someone that has a mountain of experience as a head coach, um, the style of coaching that they have, or whether or not they go with someone that it has been an assistant coach and that's, you know, doesn't have the same sort of um, head coaching experience at the NHL level, I think will tell us about how they, how they view this team. Um, but it's certainly, I don't know if there is a market that is being watched more closely right now than Winnipeg with respect to the coaching decision. So I'm looking forward to it. And as you mentioned, this is an off season unlike any other, not just because though of the, um, in my opinion, not just because of the need to hire a coach and looking for that fit, but also just with the way that the team performed last year on the ice with some of the comments that we heard in those final weeks as well with players acknowledging that, you know, that there needed to be a change, whether that be not even necessarily in terms of personnel, but just in, in terms of approach maybe, um, and sometimes in, in attitude with it. And so I think that this will be an interesting, a very interesting off season to see what sort of pieces Kevin Shoveldayoff is able to add, whether it be through free agency or trade, um, and then how they approach the upcoming season and the upcoming training camp. So this to me is the most important off season that we have seen from the Winnipeg Jets. And I don't, I mean, I don't envy Kevin Shoveldayoff and the work that he has ahead of him, because I think that any, um, mm. I think that any Canadian market right now has more challenges added to it, just based on everything that we've gone through with the pandemic and and everything like that. I think that it adds an extra element to it that perhaps wasn't there before. So you know that they want to get the coaching in place soon because that's going to be a key part. If you're a free agent, are you wanting to, and you're a, a free agent that has a or a higher profile one, are you wanting to sign with a team that doesn't have a head coach already in place and you don't know what you're walking into? I mean, there's there's certainly, there's a lot at, at stake here for the Jets. Yeah, it, it certainly does seem like that is the thing that they first have to cross off the list and then there's a long laundry list. I mean, you sort of laid it out. I mean, it was, say what, it was a missed opportunity. You wanted to have a good juicy yeah. reality show? They should have had cameras around that <laughs> hockey team for last season, for the last while, I'm sure. Certainly it would be juicy. That being said, Sarah, um, you know, at some point they will hire a coach. We'll get to the draft mm -hmm. with the two first round picks. Um, there's tons of speculation that there could be some moves. Let me just ask you this. How different do you think the Winnipeg Jets are going to look on opening night in October than when we saw finishing up the season? So taking free agents out, um, because I'm not sure, you know, the like, say, Paul Stastny, I don't know where where he's at in terms of whether or not he would be interested in coming back and what the Jets interest in that in that is uh but you take free agents out of the mix and just with that group that they had i think that we'll see i think that we'll see some changes for it i don't know if it's going to be anything radical that goes with it i think that there's obviously look we're still in essentially a flat cap era there's a lot of challenges to being able to move players um especially when you look at the salary constraints that the jets had so I think that it'll be interesting to see. I think that by and large, though, this was a good hockey team. Yes, they underperformed. And yes, they need to be changes. I don't think that it was the right mix um, necessarily. And that's just based on, on the idea that they weren't able to perform. But they're very, to the level that we expected, but they're a very talented 
group that they have there. So I could see small tweaks here and there. I don't know though, if we're going to see the blockbuster um, deal just based on how challenging I think it can be to make, to make moves in the current that, NHL. That being basket. said, we'll, uh, we'll be waiting for uh, all of your reports on free agent day. I know people will be paying close attention to what the Winnipeg Jets do, but first they got to get a coach. I got to get through the draft and uh, man, there's going to be uh, a lot of interesting off season discussions that, We'll continue to have, and I know you'll be all over in between traveling around the country, being one of the faces of the CFL and TSN. <laughs> Absolutely, and yes, I do. Do not forget that. Um, yeah, TSN's free agent frenzy will be coming up, or we'll have wall to wall coverage as always. I have no idea if there will be any animals in the studio as there have been in the past with I don't know llamas or whatever we've had going on. But I know James Duffy and the crew will have everything under control over there and then we'll keep you up to date with everything that's going on um, and changes because inevitably even when it's a quiet start to free agent frenzy you know that there's going to be if it's in this market or elsewhere there are going to be some big names and big players that are that are signing or on the move no doubt about it sarah thanks so much for doing this really appreciate it i know how busy you are travel safe out there have a good time on the weekend say hi to dusty and uh, let's do this again soon Absolutely. Thank you so much. Finally. I mean, I just take one more pot shot at Remo. I mean, like, really, Remo? Really? It's, gotta, that's fine. I though. love it. We're starting our own. We're creating a feud. And now we'll go. That's there. it. Oh, watch out. I, I mean, you know, don't let the biceps fool you here. I'm tough. I, I don't have that reputation out there, but. Oh, yeah. Cool bet we'll line's out. already out. Orleski minus 400 <laughs> versus Remo. Sarah, have a great weekend. And thanks for doing this. Anytime. Oh, man, great stuff with Sarah. And, uh, of course, yeah, she'll be uh, on the sidelines uh, with my guy Dusty calling the game, Edmonton and Saskatchewan on Saturday night on TSN. Uh, we're going to get back to some pucks with Murata Tesh, and we will talk U.S. Open. They're on the course right now at Brookline. Mr. Dubsy himself, Dubs Anderson, coming up a little later on in the program. Uh, but do want to thank our friends at Princess Auto uh, man, if you were at the game uh, last Friday night, I hope you got there early. The Princess Auto tailgate party outside the stadium beforehand was just, it was so much fun. DJ Finesse spinning tunes, some great food, some drinks as well. And uh, you should pop by there, especially if you've got the kids with you going to the game. They'll have some great giveaways at the tailgate party beforehand. Always fun to make it even more of a game experience by spending some time outside having fun before the game begins. Of course, Princess Auto, proud sponsor of the Bombers and Gold Eyes, and the place where you find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. They got two local locations, Panet Road and Portage Avenue West. And, of course, you can shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, popped by a Boston Pizza yesterday for a little happy hour after work with a couple of the fellas. Great deals, 3 to 6 and six to and, uh, three to six and 9 to 12 each and every day at your local Boston Pizza. And, uh, man, what a great spot to watch the game as well with the game on all the screens with the big sound. Exactly what you want in a sports bar, not to mention those great pizzas, famous Boston wings, and a few ice-cold schooners mixed in as well. Pop by your local BP for the game. Or if you're staying home, check out their game day deals and order online at bostonpizza.com. And uh, tell you what, maybe you're on your way home beforehand. Grab a few blizzards for the team. And when you're doing that, pop by our friends of the Nick and Nikki DQ group. They've got four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, the DQ in Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. Blizzard season is pretty much always here, but especially right now with some nice weather, especially this weekend coming up. When you pop by the DQ, check out those new stack burgers as well. And hey, if you got to need a cake for an upcoming party, Always a part better party with the DQ ice cream cake. Hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. They'll uh, custom make your order and have it ready to pick up quick and easy at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQs. All right, let's uh, talk a little more puck right now. Murata Tesh of The Athletic joins us. What's going on, my friend? How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. It's been a fun week in NHL circles. Uh, how are you doing? How are, how are things? How's LBJ? Well, they're happy, uh, as you can imagine. I mean, uh, yeah, I, listen, the, the whole thing has been hilarious. I mean, like I was telling you off there, we cranked that video out in about 
15 minutes after the show, Remus posted it. And like 90 minutes later, it's everywhere, including the New York Post and whatnot. And I don't know. I'd like to say we planned it, knowing that this is a perfect day to do it, sort of a slow day during the Stanley Cup final. We didn't really think it through that much, but sometimes things just work out. And uh, it certainly did. And listen, it's been a huge, huge topic in and around the league. Um, I know you've been on top of this and talking to people in and around. I mean, what do you make of the certain the situation as we speak today with the Vegas job filled? Sounds like Torts is going to Philadelphia. Peter DeBoer rumored going to Dallas. And Winnipeg and Barry Trotz still standing without any sort of clarity as to who the Jets head coach is and what Barry Trotz will do. Although we know Winnipeg remains all in on the Dauphin native. Yeah. I mean, if you could have started this process, you know, a few weeks ago when all this really kicked into high gear and you could have just crossed Vegas off your list and crossed Philadelphia off your list and treated Dallas as a situation where they didn't need a coach anymore. You'd think, my goodness, Winnipeg is one, right? You would think that Barry Trotz was on a one way ticket to Manitoba. He was going to stay there um, and everything was going to shake out. And I think that the way things have broken would serve to increase Winnipeg's odds of landing Barry, um, which I think would be news to, uh, or sorry, music to a lot of people's ears, pardon me. At the same time, when you look at the uh, amount of time that he's taken and the, you know, the rumors of the $7 million offer in Philadelphia turned down and other sorts of things, it seems clear to me that the reasons why Barry Trotz is taking his time, whether personal, professional, or a combination of both, so looking after you know what he wants his ideal location to be for his last coaching job, presumably his last coaching job, I should say, um, whether that's a family consideration, whether it's this path into management we've talked about uh, many times before, I get the sense that that is so, so personally important and worth taking all of this time. Um, I don't have a sense other than, you know, I keep, I keep poking around and, and at times I've had a, I felt like I've had a sense of what the latest view from that camp is. Um, but I, I have the sense that they really are doubled down on the, we don't work on anyone else's timeline. Uh, it's sort of about what's best for Barry. And I, and I respect that completely. Uh, so I don't know that just because these doors to other teams have been closed off, that we're looking at a Monday morning Barry Trotz to Winnipeg press conference. As a matter of fact, I just think that um, those odds are still good. Other options, like I've written about Jim Montgomery, I think are still viable as well. And you're just you're just looking to make sure Winnipeg gets out of this game of musical chairs with one of the top options, which seems realistic, you know, knock on wood. Um, how long can the Jets wait? Um, this, this is a patient organization. We've talked about it in the past, and um, I think they're willing to be as patient as they can possibly be. But at what point, Murad, in your opinion, do they have to know, do they have to make a decision because of everything that's going to come after they hire their coach? Yeah, that's a great question. And as much as I can say, you know, Barry Trotz works on his own timeline, you know, the Jets have a timeline. They have important milestones coming up. And it's not a hard and fast rule that they would want a coach in place by the draft, but I have my calendar out in front of me. So the draft July 7th and 8th, right? We're exactly three weeks away from the start of it right now. And if you're the Winnipeg Jets, you do want that person in place. You want that person on stage. You want an opportunity to win a press conference in the days leading up to it where you introduce the person. You're so proud of the um, of their pedigree, of the success that they've had, whatever it is. You want him in on whatever meetings there are. Uh, so if we're sitting here on the 16th, and that's three weeks away, I think that the week of the draft is getting close to too late. You know, maybe there's a press conference on Monday the 4th or Tuesday the 5th or what have you. Part of me coming out of Canada Day long weekend. But probably you want that to happen the week prior to that, which means you probably need a decision by the end of next week. That's how I would see it in an ideal world. And yes, you can, you're willing to bend or break these sorts of rules of thumb for the right person in the right circumstances. By all means, you are. If Barry Trotz is unable to give a decision until July 1, well, I think you wait for him. I just think that in an ideal world, they'd be looking at some pretty firm decisions by the end of next week and some announcements in the week to follow that. Let me ask you this. and I don't really know my opinion or answer on this, but I'm interested in your perspective on it. We've spent a lot of time talking about, Marat, what would uh, Barry Trotz 
mean to the organization and how impactful he might be in some of the decision making going forward, particularly in terms of personnel and Mark Shifley at the top of that list. Do you think that that the influence of the head coach on the decisions of Kevin Sheveldayoff is the same regardless of who gets picked? Or is it a little different with a guy like Barry Trotz as opposed to some of the other guys that we've heard that have been mentioned that maybe don't have the resume and the time in the league that Barry does? Well, I think that a head coach would have impact one way or another. I think I'm even used to the idea of a Paul Maurice special at the end of every season. You'd get your Mark Letest or your Matt Hendricks or what have you. And no, I don't have it from Paul Maurice that that was his guy. But I think we've all sort of understood that there's this role that you know Winnipeg has filled based on coaching uh, preferences before. So that idea is nothing new. Um, I think that you'd want that person's impact, sorry, input, for a bunch of reasons. One, because the types of players you have will influence the way that you're able to play. And there's a vision that you would want to be shared between GM and coach on that front. Um, another, though, I think is because it's a it's a really great way to generate buy in early on in the process where you can demonstrate to somebody that they're part of the team, that their voice is heard. And then when you get into the, you know, does Barry Trust perhaps get more of a say than somebody else? I think that's into that nitty gritty of negotiations or if not negotiations of preferences. If Barry's sincere urge is to get into management over the next few years, whether it's, you know, as part of his coaching contract or afterwards, then if you're Winnipeg, you'd want to be able to demonstrate to him very early on that he is a valued part of that voice, um, uh, of the collective voice part of me and has an input on things. So I think that some amount of input is going to happen no matter who it is, whether it's Jim Montgomery, whether it's Barry Trotz, whether it's Scott O'Neill or uh, another coach that you know I haven't discussed a whole lot. But I think that there's a little bit more impetus to make it a real concerted effort to demonstrate that that's part of the process if it is Barry Trotz. Uh, that's a great point. Murata Tesh with us here on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. You know, when I think about, and, and Big Guy just mentioned this in the chat, um, as I said, I think most Winnipeg Jet fans, myself included, you know, are hoping that, you know, it will end with Barry Trotz. There's spent months talking about why that's exciting, I think, from a hockey perspective, certainly from an organizational perspective. But if this drags out another couple of weeks or we get into that, you know, end of the month where you're getting close to the draft and they don't have clarity on this, is there a danger of not being able to get your second choice? Let's just say it's Jim Montgomery. I mean, at what point do they, uh, at what point do you get nervous that some of your other options might be off the table by the time you get to that point that you don't want to be in in the first place? Yeah, you know, that to me, that's a, first of all, it's a great question. And knowing the answer would be very important in terms of me being able to, to guess at it. I wonder if it's almost not so much a calendar date for them so much as the sense of discussion that they're having with these guys. I mean, like to use an analogy, the Mark Shifley and Pierre-Luc Dubois situation, um, Pierre-Luc Dubois, we don't know that he's a long-term Winnipeg Jet as of yet. So that makes you more nervous about what Mark Shifley's future is. As soon as you have Pierre-Luc Dubois long-term, you can be a little bit less nervous. I feel like if you get to a point where both of your number one and two options are 50-50 or waffling or wavering, that's scary. If one's giving you a whole lot of confidence and just needs to work on some things and the other one's out of the picture, that's not as scary. And I think that comes down to what the individual situations are. There is one thing, though, Hustler, that I've, I've thought about before. And I've had guys explain this to me. I've had coaches explain this to me in recent weeks that, okay, sure, Winnipeg, um, after a tumultuous season, not being New York or L.A., you know, all that same stuff we hear about unrestricted free agents and how Winnipeg's issues with that. And, you know, that's presented to me by some people as a reason to think Winnipeg's not an ideal landing spot. And this is aside from Trotz, for whom we know he'd be familiar with the province. And I think to myself, you know what, though? There are 32 NHL top league in the world head coaching jobs. There are are only a few of them available in any given year. And as much as we complain, like a guy like me complains about retreads and retreads and gosh, there must be people in college. There must be people in other levels that, you know, are really uh, able to do that sort of gig. I don't think that if you're a qual, I guess I think that there are more quality people capable of doing this type of job uh, than there are open doors, even in a market like this one. I, I just struggle to think that, 
there is nobody capable of, of excelling in this role if Winnipeg's willing to be creative in their search if they've missed out on their number two guys. You know, Derek lawn has been another name that's been thrown out. And, and I thought Ken yesterday on the program made a great comparison. You know, Eric Bieniemy has been the offensive coordinator of the Chiefs for the last few years. And I mean, the Chiefs have had this dynamic offense and they've broken all these records. And he's always been a guy that's been named as a head coaching candidate. And because of the success that they've had in the playoffs, they've gone so long that by the time he was able to interview in many cases, many of the jobs had already been filled. Um, do you think that if this series ends and there is no clarity, certainly for the Winnipeg job, we know that Detroit's hanging around and that's interesting because of course the connections that Steve Eiserman has with Breezebois and the Tampa Bay Lightning organization that we might all of a sudden start be talking about some guys that are actually busy working right now that all of a sudden are in the mix for remaining open doors. Yeah, I think that's wave two of the of the cavalry. Kind of the first line goes in, it works or it doesn't. And then if it doesn't work out, then there's this next sort of round of people to discuss. The thing that I see in that, you know, and I think about Detroit as a good example, maybe even Boston now that there's a chance that if not a rebuild, some kind of retool in that organization, you usually see a pairing of that, you know, that uh, that assistant that's thought of in high regard that gets their first head coaching job. You usually see that go towards teams that are sort of in the process of building. There's a sense of synergy there. And that's perhaps why I thought Detroit wouldn't be as ideal for a Barry Trotz, for example, or why Boston doesn't appear for him to necessarily be on the front burner of that. It seemed in Boston that after Bruce Cassidy was on his way out, they were looking more at kind of that next generation of coaches as well. Um, so I wonder if that's not necessarily Winnipeg's ideal play. They want the veteran who's going to come in with that presence and that pedigree and, and the, the veterans in the Winnipeg Zoom are, are going to listen by virtue of that person's history. But at the same time, whether it's Derek Del Lalonde, pardon me, or otherwise, you have to believe there's quality in that market. And that wouldn't necessarily be a horrible outcome either. Well, and Boston's interesting. I mean, listen, I'll be the first one to admit, I was stunned that Bruce Cassidy got fired. I mean, you just look at the the success that he's had, how much winning they've done, including this season, you know, bowing out in seven games against a very good Carolina team. I mean, one of the a really good team was going home and, you know, it was them. But when you dig a little deeper into their off season with the injuries to McAvoy and Marchand missing potentially more than half the season, Bergeron could very likely retire. It certainly seemed that way at the end of uh, the end of the series and the end of the season. Um, and the potential that David Pasternak has one year left on his deal and has been rumored to potentially be on the move. Um, we, for the first time in a long time, could be seeing a very, very different situation, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Boston Bruins as opposed to the consistent contender that we've always expected to be playing deep into the playoffs and be one of the toughest outs in the National Hockey League night in and night out. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's a that's a situation to watch because I think any team with Patrice Bergeron on it, especially still playing at the level that he is, I mean, sulky trophy winning, right? I mean, that is an instant um, competitor, if not contender necessarily, there's a chance that that team can go deep, is going to win a lot of games because their most important center plays the right way at every possible moment. That's a special situation. You take that out, and now you have some really difficult decisions to make. I mean, if you took away Winnipeg's top-end talent, and of course Winnipeg didn't make the playoffs this year, they're not in Boston's range right now, and you thought to yourself, okay, um, let's say there's no Mark Shifley anymore, there's no Blake Wheeler, maybe... Nikolai Ehlers is still there. Kyle Connor is still there. And Josh Morrissey somewhere else. Connor Hellebuck isn't here anymore. Do you then gut the team? If you're building around Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers only, or do you try to go for that retool? And I, I guess what I'm doing is I'm trying to compare those two young forwards to a David Pasternak type situation in Boston. I still think if you have Pasternak and if you have McAvoy returning to health at some point, that that's not a blow it up type situation. I think that they can still look at ways to sort of rebound and and, uh, and be competitive. And I also think being open to trading David Pasternak and sort of shopping him aggressively are two very different things. As we learned in Winnipeg a couple of years ago, I think 2019, the possibility of a Nikolai Ehlers trade was, was floated around, but you don't get a good enough offer for that. You hold on to your player and you're, you're glad you did. 
So I'm not sure what comes out of that. I'm not sure they end up gutted necessarily in Boston. You know, I, I ask Sarah this, and I'll put this to you, and it's sort of a broad question because so much of our focus has been on the coaching search and what that means going forward. But how different do you think this team is going to look when we drop the puck in October from the team that finished up uh, in, in the spring? I think it's so tough, right? That is, it's a phenomenal question and an important one as well. You, ha- you my my mind goes straight to Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler. They go, it goes straight there. If there's something shocking or cat or 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 just a big big deal, it probably comes from one of those two players in my mind. Um, I believe that the Mark Scheifele exit interview with Kevin Shevelday off and company was intense. I I believe that. I also don't think that anything that has been said is the sort of thing you couldn't walk back. If they got to a situation where Mark Shifley is in the lineup, all he has to say to all to anyone is, you know what? It was a tough season. I was really, you know, I was really in it. And, you know, I see our future going in a good direction. Life's good. He doesn't need to really deep dive it longer than that. And I think everybody's kind of back on board. But I'm still open to the possibility that that teams come calling on him. And, you, you know, I mean, you saw my piece on it last week. And I'm still open to the possibility that that's that his future even if more calm now than it used to be, is potentially in flux. I also think it's important to note that, you know, that Blake Wheeler sitting in his shoes, his no movement clause turns to a no trade clause uh, after the draft. And for the first time ever, I'm considering it at least theoretically possible that he's moved at some point. I don't think that I'm looking at that as an extreme likelihood, but I used to think that that was absolute impossible. And, And I don't see it that way anymore necessarily. Either one of those moves is absolutely enormous. And if both of them happen, absolutely the same thing. Whereas Pierre-Luc Dubois, we talk about his future. I think the most likely situation is a one-year deal. Um, Even though conversations haven't necessarily begun yet, I think that's the simplest play, whether through arbitration or otherwise, is a one-year deal. So those are the types of things that I could see as the sort of franchise-altering moves if we see them this summer. Uh, Murata Tesh of The Athletic with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Really enjoyed your piece today in The Athletic talking about the upcoming draft. And it's even more intriguing, I think, for Jets fans because of the performance of the Rangers in the playoffs, Murat. And uh, you sort of covered it. It's one thing to pick 14th. It's another thing to have another pick in that first round. Excuse me. And, I mean, listen, dream scenario, the uh, Kyle Connor jack Roslevic draft back in, what, 2015 – um, tell us a little bit about what the uh, what you were doing with your colleagues at the Athletic, digging into not the first pick at fourteen, but what might be left for the Winnipeg Jets late first round with that pick acquired in the Andrew Cop trade. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting thing. I, I was I was going through, you know, you, you project how the board is going to go based on scouts' rankings, based on the intel that you know, people much closer to those situations than myself have gathered. And you try to guess who's going to be available. You compare that to Winnipeg's prospect pool needs, Winnipeg's history, the types of picks that they like to make. And you sort of come up with your long list of players who a team like the Jets could take at 30th overall. Thank you, Andrew Kopp and the New York Rangers for making it as far as you did. Um, And there's so many variables at play that I, uh, I approached Corey Promen with a list of 20 players saying, you know what? This is like, please help me cut some from this because the board could go so many different ways. I think any one of these people could be a realistic shot for the team at 30. And he just laughed at me. He said, that's what these guys are dealing with. This is the realistic way in the NHL. I mean, somebody who the Jets have ranked in the top 15 could well make it into the second round. And there there have been some discrepancies in, in that kind of value before. Uh, so that makes it interesting in and of itself. The types of players that are going to be available but also there's a philosophical discussion to have. What, how much does the player that Winnipeg takes at 14 impact who they're able to take at 30? Do you, you know, if they're able to get sort of a blue chip prospect who everybody thinks is going to make the NHL like a Connor Geeky at 14th overall, does that mean that you're willing to gamble perhaps with, you know, Ivan Miroshnichenko, whose name I'm, I, I may have struggled with right there, who was thought of as having a top 10 talent set but whose health has been an issue and, and some folks will be concerned about him playing in Russia as well, um, but who has such an incredibly high ceiling. 
Do you treat them independently? If you end up with a defenseman like Denton Matichuk or Korchinski or Minchukov with the 14th pick, does that mean you go for a forward later? All of those sorts of different permutations. In the end, I was able to cut it to a list of approximately 13 uh, skaters who I think that the Jets would have a reasonable odds at taking. And there's some quality in there, too, uh, at this point. Um, you know, I, I love that point because we have seen when you have the benefit of having a couple picks – um, you can sort of take a swing. And I would say the Winnipeg Jets did exactly that with the Logan Stanley selection. I mean, they knew they had their blue chip guy in Patrick Line. They had this additional pick. They thought that this player had a ton of potential to be a guy that they could really lean on. And, you know, they took him there. It was far from a guarantee. And I'm not sure that that same decision is made if you didn't already have the pick that was in the bank with the blue chip number two, two overall selection. Yeah, it's, and for me, that's so interesting because theoretically, every single one of these picks is independent of the other one, right? Like, if there's a best player available, you take that player. If there's, if you believe in drafting for players with upside over that sure, over having a high floor, low ceiling, then presumably that is the the best play regardless. But I don't think that's how it works in the real world. I think that, you know, as people, when you feel like you've hit a home run already, you're more more willing to gamble. I think Logan Stanley is a great example of that. They were willing to take their time. They knew if Logan Stanley was going to hit, it wasn't It wasn't going to be the following season like with Patrick Laine, and they're willing to make a play like that in that situation. At the same time, I think in 2015, Jack Roslovic was just the highest rated player on the board. You know, it, it's so it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. Um, and the... I guess another sort of philosophical thing, too, is positionally, you would think Winnipeg has its defense set in terms of the prospects. We've talked about how Manitoba Moose is loaded with Hanela, Sandberg, Chisholm, Gavanka, even perhaps um, Kovacevic, perhaps as well. And But we know in Winnipeg that the roster today may not be the roster in four or five years. We know that very, very well. Uh, so... Winnipeg scouts have their their jobs absolutely cut out for them. There are some forwards I like in that 30 range, like um, Jimmy Snuggerud or Isaac Howard, I don't think is going to last that long. There are some opportunities for forwards who score a lot. Um, I, I'm not sure how keen they are to take Russian players necessarily, but Miro Shnichenko has made it to 30 in our mock drafts at the Athletic a couple of times, and that's, too, like, that's tempting to pass up on. There's also the possibility, Huss, and I don't know that this is front burner of making trades because the Jets are very well aware that they haven't been able to pick a lot of times in the last several years since approximately 2017 till now. And that's one of the reasons why I think they're more likely to take the Blues second round pick uh, as part of the Andrew Copp return this year as opposed to the Rangers return next year. I think that having players in the pipeline will will be helpful if they don't do that or even if they do that 30 could become two late second round picks, which analytically tends to, to be good value as well. There are so many things that could happen with that pick that that's why you write a 4,000 word piece in an attempt to guess at some of them. Hey, just quickly on that decision, the Jets, do we know when, I mean, do they basically make the decision on the draft floor at that point? Is there a, is there a point, do they have to let them know before the draft happens? I'm, I'm fascinated as to that decision, whether it's something that they can literally make just before the pick or do they have to declare their intentions in advance? Uh, it's in advance. So I, I have a team source on that that says within 48 hours of the end of the Stanley Cup playoffs. So we'll have the draft order set and then the Jets get two days to think about it. Uh, one other question. You mentioned a couple Russian players. Um, you know, from talking to people within the league as well as scouts, uh, what is what's happening geopolitically, uh, how will that affect the draft and how many teams, and I'm not sure whether you know whether the Winnipeg Jets are part of this group or not, will shy away from Russian players because of everything else happening outside of the hockey rink. Yeah, that's such a tough discussion. And like, I, I, I want to approach it with respect for the fact that, I mean, not only will there be people with Russian descent in listening to this, but also in Manitoba, I mean, we have such a, an enormous and wonderful Ukrainian community as well. And I want to be able to discuss it with some um, some empathy for that. I, I mean, I haven't seen too many examples in the NHL where geopolitics have impacted player picks. This is not the same thing as Logan Mayu in Montreal a couple of years back, for example, but it seems as though within the league, players, a player quality or, or upside, if the player is good enough, people are willing to overlook a lot of things. 
And that's even before trying to dissect, well, what quote unquote should a team do in this situation? Is a 17 and a half or 18 year old kid somehow, you know, to bear responsibility for the geopolitical situation, a war going on? Um, even if they're not, is there some symbology in that? You know, I symbolism, part of me. So I don't know how, you know, how to navigate that necessarily. I read Corey Pronman's wonderful piece at The Athletic called a draft confidential where he actually pulls anonymous scouts and executives. And there seems to be a group of player uh, of, of executives who think that teams will shy away to some degree on, on Russian products in, in the draft. Um, but not so much that the top players like Danila Yurov, for example, or Minchukov on defense or Miroshnichenko, who was thought of as a top 10 talent before Hodgkin's diagnosis. He's been cleared to return to place uh, play uh, in June, I believe. So um, those are some really high quality players. And I don't think that they're going to make it all the way through the draft. Those are first round talents. But will they go a little bit later than maybe otherwise they should? I'm not sure, because some teams may have them on a do not draft type of list. In Winnipeg's case, I think that the official policy has always been we don't draft by passport. Even when they were drafting all those Finnish players, it was, well, that was the best player on our board. It's not like we're trying to create a new Finland over here. And I think that it, that's likely you know, the policy as well. I mean, the scouts will put together their lists and they'll watch the board break as it does. And if a player is too good to pass up, they, they might not. But at the same time, you know, it, it does seem to be a delicate situation, especially in Winnipeg with the Ukrainian population that we have. The one thing that I will, I will say, um, you know, and I have no idea how the Jets are thinking about this going in, but with that selection at the end of the first round, I would say that far more likely this year than in the past, that those sort of influences might create a fall for a player being available at a spot like number 30, um, you know, as opposed to earlier in the draft when the talent says that they might take it. And that could create some interesting opportunities, at least for Winnipeg and the other teams picking towards the end of the first round. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that because some of the ranges that these guys are suggested to go in are kind of in that early teens sort of list. Like if you just look based on talent and the projections before I'll use Miroshnichenko again as an example in this situation, if you look at where scouts were rating him, I mean, Bob McKenzie's list from January has him in the top 10. And so do Pronman. Pronman, I believe, had him top five heading into the season in terms of raw talent. Um, Scott Wheeler is enamored with him as well, though there are, I mean, he's not a perfect player, but this is a top 10 type of talent. Well, maybe Winnipeg doesn't swing at 14 or another team that has multiple first round picks. Maybe they that player uh, is able to pass through a little bit. But if they have a second pick, that's that kind of situation where maybe they're a little bit more willing to, to go. And by the time that you're reaching the 30 or 31st, 32nd picks, I mean, some of the some of the value propositions in that kind of thing might be just too good to pass up. Um, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure uh, how to project how that that shakes out. Hey, Marat, just quickly before we go, what did you think of the game last night? What a way to kick off the final. Oh, my goodness. This is this is great. I, I love this hockey. I, love, I mean, that start was explosive, and then things got buttoned down. And I, and I know that Colorado won, but I, I keep thinking of – I keep thinking of it through the lens of, like, you're playing sports with your dad, and you're growing up as a kid. You, you're not – you can't beat them. There's just no way. Eventually, you uh, – you know, you reach teenagehood and you're developing like, um, you know, that elasticity, that energy. And all of a sudden you probably have the raw skills, but your dad finds a way to beat you more than he should be able to. You know, he's not as fast. He's not as big or whatever else. But there's just like this intelligence or he's seen all of your shit before, so to speak. And I've thought of the Tampa Bay Lightning as that team. They've been through everything these last few seasons. They've rolled over some top, uh, you know, talents and Blake Coleman to Brandon Hagel. You got Nick Paul making a big impact. And yes, they gave up game one. But as dynamic as Colorado is, as dynamic as all of the teams Tampa Bay has beaten have been, there's this weird sense in the back of my mind that this team will always be able to find something. Uh, and so whether it's Colorado that breaks through and is simply too good to be denied because they're probably the better team in terms of their talent level, or if Tampa Bay can just pull another rabbit out of their hand with that old man strength kind of business, I don't know. <laughs> it's just fun. I just, it's such good hockey. Okay. Like, thank goodness these two teams are playing right now. Bring on game two and uh, let's hope we get seven in this series. Marat, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, love the article today. Uh, be well, and we'll talk to you next week.
right on. Thanks, guys. Uh, at WPG Marat. Check out Marat on Twitter. And, of course, check out the great piece on the upcoming NHL draft right now at The Athletic. We're going to switch from the pucks to the U.S. Open with dubs coming up in just a sec. Of course, whenever we talk golf on Winnipeg Sports Talk, we do it for our friends over at Breezy Bend Country Club. If you're looking for a great long-term home for you and your family on a course with an amazing junior program, women's program, wonderful clubhouse and patio, and an amazing course, Breezy's the spot for you. Think about getting on that waiting list for next season. Talk to Corey Johnson over at the club or check them out online at breezybend.ca. And hey, if you're looking for a new whip this summer, Start your search over with the gang at Not Auto Corp. Why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Not team? Pop down and see them at Waverly and McGillivray. Check out all the cars in the lot, including all the Teslas they have. They've been the Tesla leader in Manitoba for just about a decade. They've also got that great Tesla experience program going on if you're thinking about switching over to electric. Not Auto Corp's at Waverly and McGillivray, and you can check them out online at not.ca. And uh, hey, we'll crack a... Little Canadian club and ginger with Dubsy coming up. Uh, always great to have on the golf course. And hey, if you pop by the Canadians bottle shops right now, we've got a special offer with every six pack of the ready to drink CC and ginger. You'll grab a Winnipeg Blue Bomber Slim Can Koozie and be entered to win an autographed jersey. And they're giving away an autographed bomber jersey at every Canadians bottle shop. So make sure you do that before you get ready for this hot weekend. And, of course, get ready to sip that CC at IG Field, as, of course, they are the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Let's hit the course. Brookline, U.S. Open. It's major week. we got to have some time with our guy, Dubs Anderson. Mr. Dubsy, how are you, my friend? Happy Thursday, my man. You know, I live and breathe for these major championships. This is a top four week for me. I haven't slept getting ready for this one. We're finally off to the races. We got a real golf course, Hustler, and we got a real field. All those bozos from the Live Golf League, they're coming back to take on the best of the best. And this is what we got. I mean, what a differentiate this golf course is going to be. Guys are going to be making sevens, eights. They're going to be looking like me after about 10 of those CC and dries out on the golf course, Hustler. Happy Thursday, mate. Great to have round one underway. Well, and it's great to be talking about the golf on the course because we know, as you mentioned, I mean, the live story has dominated the sport and really sports conversation for the last number of weeks. And uh, my buddy Jeff Feinberg was on last week. He said, listen, just wait till next week. I mean, as much as we're excited for the tournament, just get ready for these press conferences on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I mean, you cover this very closely. What did you make of what we heard? Are the awkward conversations with the likes of Phil Mickelson, a really strange one with Brooks Kapka, who's not even part of that tour, although his brother is. I mean, uh, there's a lot of fireworks in front of microphones as well. Hey, it was always going to be awkward. I mean, Phil Mickelson, he looks like he's uh, Tom Hanks with Wilson out on that Lost Island, whatever that movie's called. I mean, he hasn't had a shower in months, poor lefty, but we knew it was coming. I mean, surely he's just got paid, what, $200 million, and he doesn't have some PR representative that can coach him a little better on some of these answers. I mean, he's getting short saying, yeah, 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 get to the point. Brooks Kepkes tell him to shut up. He's done hearing it. Dustin Johnson, he didn't even want to be there, so... We knew this was coming, and for these guys, if you're a little uncomfortable, who cares? You're getting paid an absolute motz. You confront the media for a couple of days out here at you know, the country club in Brookline. So it's a sign of the times. I mean, some of the golfers are just absolutely fed up with it, as you should be, right? Even like the whole media coverage coming into this, every second question, what about Liv? What about Liv? When we got such a good tournament, such a good field going on, but I totally get it. I mean, the Liv thing, it ain't going away. Too much money. They needed a couple of big names to give it legs. They got that. They got DJ. They got Phil. I mean, all these guys, I'm not big on them this week because they just don't have that much form. I mean, it's a bunch of washed up guys who haven't been playing a lot of golf. So the live thing, it's a bit of a putt-putt mix, you know, long drive contest. Um, it's not traditional golf for me, but, hey, it's definitely not going away. If you want to see real golf tournament, we got one coming up here this week, that's for sure. Well, and of course, John Rahm's the man. And, um, you know, I, I, I was most impressed with his. I mean, Rory McIlroy's sort of been the conscience of the PGA Tour and has yeah. been incredible with what he said. And, my God, I mean, the ending uh, up here north of the border last Sunday with uh, Rory and JT and my guy Tony Finau going at it was exactly what the tour needed. We didn't see John Rahm at that tournament, though. We heard from him, and, uh, you know, I thought what he had to say was exactly what the tour needed. And... In a lot of ways, he's right. Um, the $400 million for a guy like Rom isn't going to change things. That's not the case for everybody on the PGA Tour. But when he says, 
When I think about a 54-hole shotgun start, that seems like a fun thing you do with your buddies, not necessarily the truest test of the best in the world. Yeah, I mean, John Rahm, you've got to get out more, mate. There's a lot more fun things to do than 54 holes of uh, shotgun golf. But, yeah, look, it, it's good that Rahm, McElroy, JT, these guys have been big advocates, and we couldn't have asked for a better tournament last week. They're the RBC Canadian Open. I mean, you Canadians know how to throw a party, Hustler. I tell you, I don't know if the boys were jacked up on a bit of Tim Horton or what was going on, but that was a great Sunday. The PGA Tour needed that to showcase, say, hey, this is where the best of the best play. This is what we're dishing out. But what scares me, what happens in four weeks from now? It's great. We've got a major championship this week. It's the talk of the town. But what happens when we get to the Barbasol Classic and we don't have all the big names trying to get their final turn up and we got the next event up there in Portland and they're playing for, you know, $25 million. Some of these other names, you know, it's easy for guys like Rory who's made, you know, $60 million in careerings to say, hey, I don't need any extra dollars. Why would I go and play that league? It's not the case for a lot of these guys. Once you get outside that top, you know, 50, top 100, they're trying to chase the bag. And some of these guys, not to say they're sellouts, they're not bad people, but they're not so invested in chasing legacy. They don't do it for the majors. It's a job for them. I mean, for me, Hustler, you know, we're, we're old school. I, I want to put on that green jacket, baby. I think the time may have passed, but that's what we grew up looking towards. That's what, uh, you know, we saw a spy towards. For me, that is the pinnacle of golf. But unfortunately, not everyone feels the same. And uh, I think this is just the beginning. I, I'm hearing whispers that there's a couple of other big names set to announce on Monday that they're going to make the leap. And I mean, I look at potentials. I wouldn't be shocked if a guy like... Ricky Fowler, Brooks Kepka. I mean, for Ricky Fowler, he's struggling to keep his tour card. He's playing on exemptions. Why would he not entertain it? He could warrant a very big dollar by going over there because he brings the eyeballs. No, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I mean, after watching Brooks's press conference, um, I thought it was much more likely that he might be the next guy going over there, especially Guilty. with his brother Chase that's already there too. Yeah. Um, well, one guy we know that's not going there is Rory McIlroy, our defending champion here in Canada, the RBC. And man, what a morning he had just about bogey free until 18. But at the top of the leaderboard right now in a four way tie at three under par um, is Rory back. It's been a long time since he's won a major, but man, it seems like his game is ready to do it again. Yeah, Rory's back. I, I think it's all confidence for Rory McIlroy when he's playing golf. Not golf swing. He's not up top between the years. He is absolutely dynamite. And I think that backdoor runner-up finish that he had at the Masters from nowhere, that catapulted him. He said, hey, I'm still a big deal here. He turns it back to 2014 when he last got that major victory. So I love what I've been seeing. Uh, he solidified it there with the win on Sunday. And the golf swing just looks amazing. I mean, what stood out for me, he didn't have the caddy on the bag. So he had to step out a lot of his own yardages and he was really committed to the kind of shot that he wanted to play. And sometimes that's the difference. Instead of just saying, well, okay, Caddy, what, what club you want me from here? 150, okay. He was very precise, very finite. And I think that helps a guy like Roy McIlroy, who he's an overthinker. Just you know, step aside. Get out of the way, Roy. Do what you do best. Just play what's in front of you. React to the numbers. And when he's on, I mean, everyone agrees. Probably the most talented guy in the world of golf apart from the big cat, of course. But, mate, he's here, three under today. He's going to be a factor going into the weekend. Well, and, and you know what I mean? I know you spend a lot of time over on the grid talking about the odds board, as we do here. And, uh, you know, there was kind of four clear guys that was a group of favorites and then a big gap to the guys at 25 or 30. And it was Rory, it was JT, it was Scotty Scheffler, and John Rahm. And, and Rahm has been somewhat quiet uh, but I was expecting a big performance that this week, this tournament and this style of golf that the U.S. Open and the USGA puts forth seems to be picture perfect for John Rahm. And, you know, despite the fact that he's a couple shots back, you get in under par in round one. It seems exactly the sort of first round that you want to get. And uh, John Rahm got that earlier today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, don't sleep on any of the guys too over par. You're still in it after today. But I mean, John Rahm, defending champion. We've got such high standards for big Rambo. It hasn't been good enough. For him, I, I know he got the recent win there at the Mexico Open, but, I mean, that was a, you know, C-grade field at best. But, look, what he did at Torrey Pines last year, it was special. I think we're going to see that again this weekend. A lot of big names in contention, congested leaderboard, a lot of jockeying over the weekend. And, look, when John Rahm's on, he scares me. The, the short game's been a little dodgy. But, again, this week, the way the course is set up, you've got this really thick Rough, you don't have to have the best short game. You've just got to really hack it out. It's it's actually similar to playing, you know, a lot of flop shots, bunker shots, if you will. So John Rahm, if he just gets himself into the tournament, one under par today, 
that's not a guy I want uh, coming after me. You need some big shoulders to win the US Open. It's the toughest out of all four. Big Rambo, the Spanish bull. Yeah, he's got a big set on him. Well, and it's and it's funny you say that, um, you know, about, you know, getting out of the rough because, I mean, listen, the, the greens are so small here. I mean, the yeah. champion is going to have a good short game and they'll be getting some ups and downs and avoiding bogeys. Uh, but the way it was said to me, I mean, with the big hitters and why they've been so successful, listen, if you're chopping out of some big rough, better to do it 350 yards down the uh, the fairway as opposed to 300. And, I mean, it just, for the shorter hitters, hitting the fairway, absolutely mandatory because, um, you know, if you don't have that length, you're at a big disadvantage right from you know, the first shot of the hole. Yeah, it's an absolute must. And an oversight for a lot of people is when you've got small greens, right, and they're getting really firm with the wind there, if you're coming out of the rough, you can't spin the ball, you can't flight the ball. So if you hit a lot of these greens, you're going to take a one hop and straight over. Where if you're coming from the fairway, you can really control the ball. So that's why I think it's an absolute premium to be coming from the short stuff this week. And for the shorter hitters, as you touched on, if you're going to be wayward, you can take them out of the equation. But for me, you've got to be coming from the short stuff if you want to be a factor for this one. Um, whoever hits the most greens, I think they're going to be right there Sunday. I mean, we've got a 120-yard par 3 11th hole hustler. The guys are even struggling to hit that one out there this afternoon. The wind is making this such a tough golf course, the little post stamps. And this is what we want to see. These guys looking normal, looking like us <laughs> out there for a Saturday afternoon game, making doubles and triples like nobody's business. Yes, of course. The uh, the annual humbling of the best in the world by the Love USGA it. is what this event is all about. Uh, you know, for folks, many people probably tuning in right now haven't seen what happened in the morning right now. Um, what have we learned about this course so far as far as USGA setups go? Um, and tell us about the conditions and how that's been affecting what these guys are facing. Yeah, again, I, I mean, you know, half the field's already out there. The leading scores at three under par. That tells us this is a very, very tough golf course. It's getting really windy out there this afternoon. The guys who teed off early definitely had the favorable draw, but I expect more of the same conditions tomorrow. The rough is very penal. It's already, it, it looks close to three and a half, maybe even pushing four inches. I hope they don't cut it for the rest of the week. Uh, the fairway's pristine conditions, and again, the, the greens are only going to get harder and firmer the more wind we get out there. So this golf course, the biggest defense is going to be coming in there from 150 yards. If you don't find these greens trying to get up and down, I mean, you're going to see players playing with upside down putters, with three woods, with 60 degrees. They're going to lose balls in bunkers. Um, this one's an absolute theme park for the professional golfers, if you will. Really tough test, and that's what we want to see. Distance is going to be good, but you need to have every single trick in the bag this week. It's a, it's a battle of attrition. We're in Boston. This is going to be the Boston Marathon. But you can't fake one. You really have to go and earn this one if you want to lift the trophy come Sunday afternoon. Dubsy's with us. Uh, give him a follow on Twitter at Mr. Dubsy and check out all of his contributions over on the Sports Grid Network. Uh, Dubs, we mentioned the top four. Who are the other guys that you were sort of high on? Who are you paying attention to that we might be talking about on the weekend? Yeah, a couple of guys who uh, haven't really stood up at the majors. I, I call them the pillow fighters, if you will. Xander Shoffley <laughs> and Paddy Cantlay. I mean, they, they've got great records at the US Opens, but they sort of lack that killer mindset. They recently won the Zurich Classic Partners event together. That doesn't count. Xander Shoffley won the gold medal. Who cares? Who wants a gold medal? Please, mate, maybe I'd, I wouldn't mind a gold medal. But you know what I'm saying, Hustler? These guys need to step up at the majors. And I think it's a golf course that really suits... Paddy Cantlay, I got him at 24 to 1. I like that number. And a guy like Victor Hovland, the young, smiling Norwegian, baby faced assassin, you can get him at 31 to 1. A three time winner, yet to win here in the States. I love his golf game. People are skeptical about the short game. I'm not. I think this golf course really suits him. Uh, listen, I love the fact I actually got a 35 on Vic uh, on Vic Hovland. So that's I'm a good number to that one. And the same thing for my guy, Tony Fino. And listen, I feel for Tony. He shoots a 64 in the final round. I believe they said with his strokes gained, that would win over 95% of PGA Tour events. But Rory was vintage Rory on the weekend. Uh, what do you make of Tony, big tone? Because it seems like his game is perfectly suited for the U.S. Open. He's got the hands, but you know he can bomb that thing. And uh, man, he's such a popular player. It would be such a great story if he could get that win. I mean, there's no better guy than Tony Fina. And Hustle, if I was going out for a money game, you know, on the weekend or off season, Tony Fina would be one of the first guys 
I pick. You put him on the home track, relaxed environment. The guy's going to give you 59 every second round. He has got that high of a ceiling. I just think, you know, up top, he needs that killer instinct only to have a couple of wins next to his name as long as he's been on the PGA Tour. That's not good enough. And look, as good as he was last Sunday, I, I dare say if Roy McIlroy and JT didn't post those numbers, what would Tony have actually posted? He's absolute gravy when there's no pressure on him. He's always chasing. So, look, I'd love to see him be there. Um, and, and, look, there's two ways to do it. He doesn't have to be the front runner on Sunday. If he can just stalk a couple of shots back, we know he can make birdies on a very tough golf course where some of these guys can't. They don't have the distance. They don't have the game. But for me, Tony Finau, probably the best guy out in the PGA Tour. You'd love to see him make it tilt at this one. He's too good. He deserves a major eventually. I mean, he's still got plenty of years left here on the PGA Tour. Hey, Dubs, before we go, you see that hockey game last night? Uh, well, oh, who do you make baby. of the cup final? Who you got? Baby, what happened to Vasilevsky? Best goaltender between the pipes. I, I, I'm thinking twice now. I was big on the Rangers. I got him at 6-1. to one. That went out the window. So I hopped on the Tampa Bay Lightning. That was spotty at best. They made a game of it. We're going to OT. I'm saying, hey, we're on here. We got tickets here. And then, nah, it was straight over with a minute and a half. But, mate, Stanley Cup playoffs hits different. That is that is a sport. Artistry on ice. The physicality, if you will. I mean, I used to love the Mighty Ducks, but this is the real thing. Love to see it. Superstars in action. I'd love to see the Lightning make a series of it. I'd love to see it go to at least six, maybe seven. Dubs, you're the best, man. Enjoy the U.S. Open. It doesn't get much better than this, and let's do this again soon. Appreciate your time as always. You're a gentleman, a hustler. Have yourself a Thursday, my man. <laughs> Take it easy. Ah, nobody does it better. Our boy, Dubs Anderson. Follow him on Twitter, at Mr. Dubsy. Uh, you'll see him on with uh, Cam and Gabe on Sports Grid. I saw him doing some work with Megan Payton earlier today, interviewing Avery Johnson. An absolute beauty if there ever was one. All right, we got to get Remus back in here. Uh, hey, I do want to give, of course, a big shout out to our friends at Little Brown Jug. Been a big week over at the brewery, as well as for us here at Winnipeg Sports Talk. And hey, if you're getting ready for this beautiful summer weekend, a hot summer weekend that's coming up, you better make sure you cover all the bases. And that includes grabbing your 1919s or maybe the new summer variety pack. You can pick it up at any of your favorite beer stores around the city, or better yet, pop down and see them on William avenue at the brewery and don't forget we're going to be doing a show not tomorrow but a week tomorrow friday june 24th we'll set up shop at lbj welcome you all down as well and have a few pops after the show is over at 3 p.m and of course you can also check them out online at littlebrownjug.ca and order for home delivery to get ready for the weekend uh our friends at assiniboy downs have had another great week I did not have a great week going head to head against Michael Remus. That being said, shout out to everyone that entered in their picks for race six over the last three days. We'll be doing it again Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. Um, the top winners will get invites and we'll also um, do some random selections of some other entrants to join myself and Michael Remus for that world-class prime rib buffet and a great night of racing out of the track in the future. Uh, of course, you can find out more at asdowns.com. And if you want to bet on the races from home or around the world, go to hpibet.com and open an account today. We got to get to the cool bet lines but first, let's get Remus back in here. Uh, Remo, what a whirlwind today. You got Stormy and Sarah kicking it off. Great stuff with Marat. And the energy of Dubs is absolutely unmatched. Uh, he is quickly becoming one of the most popular regulars on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Great chat and golf with Dubs. I think a lot of people enjoyed hearing his takes on the hockey yesterday. Sorry about his Rangers <laughs> ticket. But uh, what, a, what a conversation that was. And I am looking at my DraftKings. Lineup. I don't know. I can never. I can never do well in golf. I don't know enough about the stats and stuff. Not not my sport, but I do enjoy playing. So I will be following following this weekend. Yeah. Um. Uh, as I said, you know, a quick leaderboard update. While we're talking about it, we just kind of hit it with uh, with dubs. But I mean, the uh, second half of the tournament is out on the course right now. Uh. But it is Rory McIlroy three under par, just about bogey three free. But he was four under par on this 18th hole. Did bogey 18. He's in a four-way tie. Joel Damon, David Lingmurth, and Callum Terran, who I'm not familiar with, sharing the lead right now. Uh, a group at minus two, including Aaron Wise. 
And then you get to minus one, and we start seeing some of these big names. Two-time major champion Colin Morikawa, John Rahm, my pick to win this. He was one under. Adam Scott, Max Homa, Will Zalatoris as well. Top Canadian right now is Adam Hadwin, who's one under. He's on the fifth hole right now. And Corey Connors, even through six. A um, couple other Canadians. Oh, the bad guy, Patrick Reed. He's one over through five. Mac Hughes, two over. He's in the clubhouse, as is Canada's Ben Silverman as well. So very much in the mix so far. Nick Taylor, by the way, as well. Uh, two over par, but he's just playing his fifth uh, fifth hole. Bottom line is, just par is a win on this golf course. Get in as close to par as you can and hang around for the weekend and see what happens. Remo, let's get to the... Uh, actually, just quickly before that, I want to get to some bomber news. Um, which we should quickly talk about uh, because, of course, the Bombers taking on Ottawa tomorrow. Ed Tate will join us from Ottawa uh, at the beginning of the program to tee up tomorrow night's game. Uh, and an uh, old friend of ours making his debut in double blue tonight. But the Bombers released wide receiver Kelvin McKnight earlier today. But the big news, Remo, for the blue and gold is that big Jackson Jeffcoat's back in the lineup after missing the home opener last week. Okay, whoa, whoa, I thought you were going to say the big news is no Dakota Prukop. What are they going to do in short yardage? And what does this mean for, you know, the goal line for fantasy purposes? Does this mean we're not going <laughs> to see any go there. one-yard plunges? Um, Kelvin McNutt, I remember last year there was one week where uh, he started and there was a lot of hype for him. I think the emergence of Dalton Schoen made him expendable um, or he didn't catch on. So uh, no Kelvin McKnight. And as you said, yeah, Jackson Jeffcoat, him coming back will be huge in terms of getting to the passer. And they've kind of made life a bit miserable for Mazzoli at times, uh, whether it's in the Great Cup or last week as well. And yeah, you, you can't got to mention uh, Dakota Prukop. He's not in. So short yardage going to be a concern. How are they going to get the one yard plunge in, especially or in the middle of the field when you need that to get those key first downs? I mean, the Bombers... Short yard package has been like automatic. Going back to Chris Trevler and Sean McGuire took it. He took it to another level last year with the touchdowns. What McGuire leading the team in touchdowns was hilarious. Well, I mean, he had like Andrew eighteen Harris carries hate. for twelve TDs or something like that. <laughs> Andrew Harris must hate Sean McGuire. Just cost him so many <laughs> touchdowns last year. Not as uh, much as you. Not as much as you. Because I think Andrew Harris was wanting to win games. You were trying to win pools, and he was your nemesis all last season. Get to, I mean, Harris had a, you look at his numbers, he didn't have a lot of touchdowns, but how many times did he take it to the one and they just like plunged it in with Sean McGuire? And I think people are putting out, what do you remember most from last season? I just posted a gif of Sean McGuire going in from one yard over and over. And we saw it last week with Prukop. He did look good on the ground. Um, so we'll see how it goes here. Uh, Mahoney, tomorrow night. Remo, Remo is his own personal Tommy fam. Don't mess with his DK yeah. lineup. Hey, <laughs> we had a contest last week for in our WST group, 50 people. I finished 10th. It was thankfully the top 10 got paid out this week. We're doing only the top five get paid out. So we got 40. I saw 42 last time. So I'm oh, ready I'm to roll. I'm going to have to jump in on that. And of There's... course, get in before kickoff tonight, because as we mentioned, it is Andrew Harris's debut for the Toronto Argonauts taken on the Montreal Alouettes. I would love to see a great crowd at BMO. I'm not really expecting that. Uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, as we talked about with Sarah earlier today, Remo, we're going to see Andrew Harris go out there determined and playing with a chip on his shoulder the size of a freaking boulder. Yeah, and if you want to look at Andrew Harris's uh, yardage props. They do have one on cool bed here. Player rush yards, 75 and a half over under. That seems like a high number. I think you look at the depth chart. There's not much behind him. So he's going to get a lot of the carries. I'm curious to see how it's going to be. I always think Montreal is going to be in a high scoring game. I'm a big fan of Vernon Adams Jr. When he is on, he is tough to beat. Uh, and, and I actually like some of the receiving um, yard props. Uh, Eugene Lewis over 65 or Jake Wineke over 50 and a half. I found, I think the Eugene Lewis one is, is interesting, but we'll see what the crowd is like at BMO. I don't think we're going to see a BC place like yeah, crowd. And unfortunately. Tor and Toronto, didn't Toronto win the East last year? Yeah. And they were still underrated the whole time, but they're, they're turning it back us with this. <laughs> they're got like the, the 2014, 2015 offense with Harris Brandon Banks, Banks and Daveris Daniels is on Toronto. 
McLeod Bethel Thompson's the quarterback. So I'm curious about Toronto. I feel like no one really bought them, even though they won the East last year. No one's Is been it... buying anybody in the East for a long time. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats Hamilton's haven't helped good. that with the way that they performed over the course of the last couple seasons as the heavy favorite in both years. And then getting pumped by the Bombers in the 2019 Grey Cup. And then uh, blowing that lead against the Bombers in last year's Grey Cup. Uh, as far as the lines go, the Argos are three and a half point favorites uh, at Cool Bet Canada for tonight's game. Uh, the other games right now, that bomber number has just continued to plummet. Um, it opened up at a number that was way too high, and I think they've been getting all the action coming in on the red block. So that number, which was six and a half, is now two and a half for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Ottawa, two and a half point home dog tomorrow. And the Bombers, minus 154 on the money line. So, I mean, it's been a while since we've seen a number that low for the Bombers. Obviously, Ottawa played them very tight and could have easily won that game last weekend here in Winnipeg. People expecting another good one tomorrow will be all over it. But right now, you can get the Bombers at minus two and a half and my, uh, for the game and minus 154 money line. And the over-under on that game is at 46. Uh, Hamilton right now is a one-point favorite over the Calgary Stampeders. And the number on the Elks keeps on going the wrong way for the home team. Edmonton now an eight-point underdog after opening as six-and-a-half-point dogs. And I wouldn't be surprised if that continues to go in the favor of the Riders. Riders especially defensively look great. And everything about the Elks looked um, amateur hour last week in there. Uh, thrashing at the hands of Nathan Rourke and the BC Lions. Yeah, I think that total in that Saskatchewan and Edmonton game was at 49 yesterday. It's at 51. Now, uh, do we still know who the quarterback is for, for Calgary? Is it Bo? Is it Jake Mayer? I'm not I'm not even sure. Have they announced it? I know maybe they have. Well, they're it's they've Saturday. Been... Yeah, they, he said if, if Bo's able to go, he will be the guy. But as I said, I think his sort of time is uh, the, 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 the sand is getting to the bottom of the egg timer on BLM. And I think it's going to be Jake Meyer uh, very soon. Hey, just one more thing on Andrew Harris. We do have season rushing props for Harris. The over under on his season is a thousand seventy five and a half over is even money under is minus one thirty three and total rushing touchdowns in the regular season is only six Remo. And considering the lack of, Anything else in the backfield and the fact that McLeod Bethel Thompson is really their guy at quarterback, I wouldn't I would be surprised if that goes under. I think I might have a little tickle on Harris on the over six touchdowns for the regular season. I hope he gets over six. That's the interesting one. There was that's I, rushing touchdowns, not that's not passing touchdowns as well, just rushing. Mm -hmm. There was one prop, uh, Brandon Banks. I thought his number was really high. Maybe it's come down, it's at 1025. I'm curious how he's going to do. I loved Brandon Banks a couple of years ago in Hamilton. Uh, he was injured last year. Uh, well, can he turn back the clock with uh, with Toronto? 1,025. Uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was a bit higher wh a while ago. So may, I would maybe go over there. I don't know. Well, I mean, you got to stay healthy to get that number as thing. well. <clears throat> Anyways, I'm looking forward to this game tonight. Of course, uh, it will be. On TSN, Montreal and Toronto. And tomorrow, it's Bombers Red Black, 6.30 start. We'll be all over it tomorrow on WST. Speaking of tomorrow on WST, Eddie Tate's going to join us. The Ren Dog himself, Sean Reynolds of Kenny and Rennie fame and Sportsnet's going to jump on with us from Denver and talk a little more Jets in the Stanley Cup final. And Dave Pagnotta as well, talking NHL news from around the league and the Cup final will join us from Denver as well. Folks, stay tuned for those of you that are with us on YouTube because much like we did yesterday with bumping everybody over to Kenny and Rennie and their cup preview, tomorrow's a game day, and that means coming up right now, Darren Bombing and our guest from yesterday, the legend himself, Chris Walby, are going to chop it up and get ready for tomorrow's game on Bonfire's Game Day Winnipeg. So we'll send you over that. If you're with us on YouTube, don't need to go anywhere. Remo will press the magic button and you'll show up and we'll see what Darren and Chris have for us this afternoon. Um, big thanks to all the guests. Great to have Sarah Orleski on the show. And of course, Stormy Bonatoni, Murat Atesh, always a favorite of everyone. And the man himself, Dubs Anderson, as we keep an eye on the U.S. Open. Folks, thanks so much for being with us. Trout Swatch continues tomorrow. If we had know anything, we'll let you know about it. Make sure to follow our socials and hit that. Uh, by the way, 
hit the red subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit that thumbs up and turn the notifications on. I will say we don't often do it, but if, if the trots watch, it looks like it's ending at any point, we'll probably be jumping on ASAP. So you'll want to get a notification that we're doing that live. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks to all of our guests and, of course, the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Tomorrow, lots of puck talk, Bombers Red Blacks, Trots Watch, U.S. Open, and Friday Marbles on WST. We'll see you tomorrow at 1 live on YouTube. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Oh Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.